soon. Thank you. Meeting scheduled for next month. About two years ago, the Brentwood, Maryland post office facility was closed due to anthrax contamination. The House Government Reform Committee is meeting at this hour to review cleanup efforts and look into safety of U.S. postal facilities. This is live coverage on C-SPAN. This hearing will examine the conduct of the cleanup, the manner by which the Postal Service determined that the building is safe to reoccupy, and how well the Postal Service communicated with its workers. Let me emphasize that last point. Over the next few months, the Postal Service will be asking its employees to re-enter a building where two of their colleagues were killed by an invisible airborne germ. It goes without saying that they're afraid. A partial cure for their fees, for their fears is, is complete open communication about the cleanup and about their options. Yesterday, we learned that a suspicious package found in the Greenville, South Carolina airmail facility was confirmed to contain ricin, a deadly plant toxin. Although it appears that no ricin escaped the package, the facility was shut down for environmental testing last night. This is a developing situation, so I don't expect to hear the full story in this hearing. But how the Postal Service handles the situation in Greenville will certainly show uh, how well they have learned the lessons of Brentwood. I'm also certain that the news of the Greenville incident will weigh heavily on the minds of postal employees around the country in the coming days and weeks. So we need to be certain that appropriate time and resources are aimed at answering whatever concerns or questions they may have. We have two panels of witnesses today. On the first panel are Bernard Unger, a frequent uh, testifier here uh, from the General Accounting Office, who has been examining the Postal Service's communication with its employees. We have Thomas Day, the Postal Service Vice President of Engineering, and Jerry Lane, Manager of Capital Metro Operations, both of whom have been intimately involved in every aspect of the cleanup and its reopening. And Davis Lane from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and Theodore Gordon of the District of Columbia Department of Health. OSHA and the D.C. Department of Health helped plan the cleanup and participated in the Environmental Clearance Committee, which reviewed the cleanup. On the second panel, we'll have Dick Collins of the National Postal Mail Handlers Union and Mike Reed of the American Postal Workers Union. Together, they represent most of the craft employees who will be returning to this facility. I want to thank everybody for coming, especially in light of the schedule change. In addition to these witnesses, the National Association of Letter Carriers and Councilman Vincent B. Orange of the District of Columbia were invited to testify but unfortunately couldn't attend today's hearing. But without objection, their written testimony will be included and placed in the record that Mrs. Norton had requested. Uh, I also understand that swearing in Mr. Rhodes and Mr. Heinrich are going to be here uh, to be uh, Keith Rhodes and, and Jan Heinrich with GAO. We'll swear them in because uh, we may be asking them questions. And I now uh, would recognize a distinguished delegate from the District of Columbia, Mrs. Norton. Thank you very much, Chairman Davis. When I approached Chairman Davis to ask that a hearing on the Kersine Morris Postal Facility, formerly known as Brentwood, be held prior to its reopening, he readily agreed. Uh, my, uh, my good friend Tom Davis has my sincere gratitude for today's hearing. This is the second congressional hearing on Kersine Morris and the first full committee hearing since anthrax was discovered in the building, resulting in two tragic deaths and serious illness to two employees and subjecting other employees to a medical regimen, including the drug Cipro. Last year, I requested a field hearing concerning this facility. It was held July 26, 2002, to bring the Congress to the community and encourage attendance by residents and employees at a time when there was still uncertainty and rumors concerning health and safety matters. However, today's hearing is appropriately before the full committee and here in the Congress itself. Kirstine Morris is responsible for congressional mail and all mail to federal buildings in this area, as well as mail to residents, businesses, and others in the city and region. Moreover, despite the independence of the Postal Service, Congress has the ultimate responsibility to ensure that postal facilities here and around the nation <coughs> are not exposed to bioterrorism. I said at last year's hearing that before employees or the public return to Kersine Morris, I would request a hearing to investigate whether re-entering a building where there had been two tragic deaths as well as illnesses to employees uh, 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 posed any risks. 
At that hearing, I asked the CDC to conduct an epidemiological or similar study to compare the health of workers from Brentwood with the health of workers who have never worked in an anthrax contaminated facility. In addition, along with a member of the Senate <clears throat> and a member of the House who does not serve on this committee, I requested a GAO report on the anthrax episode from its origins to its effects. I say again that I believe that in order to further reassure employees, public officials should be the first to enter the building before employees are asked to return to work. And I am pleased that union and postal officials have said they want to be a part of such a reentry. The job of contaminating a 632,000 square foot facility where 2,400 employees worked has no precedent anywhere in the world of which I am aware. <coughs> Excuse me. We have an obligation today to learn whether the Postal Service has done it right, to try to determine whether such an event could occur again, and to learn how to prevent any such reoccurrence here or elsewhere. The new proposed irradiation facility on the property also raises new issues that require explanation. Besides the paramount issue of safety and security for human beings in this virtually new facility, we will be interested to learn if the witnesses can lay to rest such matters as the invidious comparison some have made between the Hart and Brentwood cleanups and the delay in closing the facility. I hope that today's hearing will provide enough information <coughs> excuse me, to allow us to put behind us one of the most serious and tragic episodes in American workplace history. However, let us never forget Joseph Kersine, Jr. and Thomas Morris, Jr., the employees who died at the old Brentwood facility. In renaming the building for these dedicated employees and family men, both born and raised in the district where the facility is located, we will be reminded of our obligation to make this and every other workplace in our city and our country safe from bioterrorism. I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I welcome today's witnesses. Well, thank you very much. Um, we'll now move to our first panel. If you would rise with me, it's our uh, custom to swear in the uh, witnesses. Some's a mistake in here. Raise your right hands. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Great. Thank you very much. The, uh, I think you know the, the rules of the committee. We try to try. We try to keep the um, testimony to five minutes. Uh, we pr probably have questions for him, uh, Ms. Norton and I in terms of what we want to ask you, but you can highlight what you want in that five minutes. When the, your light turns orange, uh, that means four minutes are up, and when it's red, five minutes. And if you could move to summary at that point. Uh, Mr. Unger, we'll start with you, and we'll move uh, right on down the row. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mrs. Norton. We're certainly pleased to be here to assist the committee in uh, looking at the reopening of the Christine Morris uh, mail facility at uh, Brentwood. Uh, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, this morning I'm accompanied by uh, Keith Rhodes, Janet Heinrich, uh, who are experts in various uh, fields in our office that related to this uh, issue, and also uh, Jay Bryant and Jack Melling uh, from GAO, who can help uh, answer questions uh, if uh, you get into some real technical topics. The tragic events that unfolded in October of 2001 at Brentwood were indeed unfortunate. A, a key lesson that was learned in, in that experience was that there is a high risk of the male being used intentionally as a conduit for hazardous substance to cause harm, whether it's intended for a postal employee or someone outside the Postal Service. Accordingly, you know, the Postal Service, public health agencies, the o Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and others must be prepared to manage and deal with this risk and to address you know, these kinds of incidents when they occur. What I would like to do in my short summary uh, this afternoon is just focus on one key area uh, in which a significant lesson uh, was learned, and that's in the area of communication with employees. This was a very problematic uh, issue back in the fall of 2001, especially at the Brentwood facility. Uh, a lot of the information that was provided to the Brentwood employees changed uh, over the course of time 
due to changing, uh, largely due to changing public health knowledge of anthrax and its implications uh, during that period of time. Unfortunately, much of the information that was given to Brentwood employees in October of 2001 turned out to be, at least initially given to these employees, turned out to be incorrect. This incorrect information, along with what the employees at Brentwood would re, uh, regard as a delay in the Postal Service's closing of the facility, ger generated a considerable amount of employee uh, distrust of management and concern. The problems at Brentwood obviously make it clear, at least the problems that occurred back in 2001, that accurate and clear information to employees is critical now even more so than before. Unfortunately, uh, recently, the, not, the Postal Service informed the employees who are likely to return to Brentwood that um, on the one hand, uh, in a more fortunate sense, the, uh, the uh, facility is safe. It has been uh, looked at. The, the de decontamination effort has taken place. Uh, the um, various public health and other authorities have looked at the test results, assessed the de decontamination, and, and de decided and determined uh, after review of all that information that the facility is safe, and we certainly have no information to the contrary. On the other hand, unfortunately, uh, the Postal Service also told employees that there is absolutely no risk uh, at returning to the facility and that the facility is 100 percent free of anthrax contamination. Uh, according to the Postal Service, unfortunately, this was an inadvertent communication that had not been fully reviewed uh, throughout the Postal Service. Uh, and the real dilemma here is, is that one cannot say, according to CDC and other authorities, that, the, that there is absolutely no risk at returning to the facility and that we can be 100 percent sure that there is no anthrax in the facility. While it's likely to be very little, if any, there, and it's likely not to be a major or a significant risk, nonetheless, uh, one cannot say that there is absolutely no risk. We have discussed this issue with the Postal Service, uh, and it has agreed to very quickly and promptly uh, provide corrected information to the employees who, who may return. And this is important because uh, the Postal Service has given these employees uh, a choice as to whether to return or go to a different facility. And it will obviously be important that they have full and correct information uh, before they return. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chairman and Mrs. Norton, I would like to conclude my uh, summary Thank statement. You. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lane. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's leadership in protecting workers from anthrax exposure and our role in preparing for the reopening of the Kersene and Morris Processing and Distribution Center. OSHA's mission is to assure safe and healthful working conditions for America's working men and women protecting workers from biohazards such as anthrax is a critical part of OSHA's role in the nation's domestic preparedness and emergency response efforts. Now, under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, it is the employer's responsibility to protect the health and safety of its workers. In 1998, an amendment to the OSHA Act broadened the definition of an employer to include the United States Postal Service. <clears throat> OSHA has been working alongside uh, the USPS since uh, the investigation into the deaths at the facility from inhalation anthrax spores began. OSHA joined the USPS at its joint command center shortly after it was established to provide a unified approach to sampling tests and decontamination for all USPS facilities and to coordinate those sampling and subsequent response actions with key stakeholders. OSHA also provided technical support to the incident command center established by the USPS for the Kersene and Morris Center decontamination. Members of OSHA's health response team with specialties ranging from analytical microbiology to building ventilation have been on site at various times throughout the last two years advising the USPS. 
In fact, the USPS air sampling plan was developed with OSHA's assistance. Our staff reviewed safety and health plans and worked with the USPS and its contractors on training procedures for the use of personal protective equipment such as respirators. In addition to technical support, OSHA ensured that employers at the site involved in the remediation effort provided a workplace free of hazards to their employees by ensuring compliance with applicable OSHA standards. As final plans were made to fumigate the building with chlorine dioxide gas, OSHA joined the USPS at its Joint Information Center to enhance communications about the decontamination work. OSHA staff also made presentations at town hall meetings reminding postal employees of their right to file complaints about unsafe or unhealthy working conditions directly with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. Following the decontamination in March of 2003, OSHA sent a letter to the incident commander at the Kersine and Morris Center expressing the agency's concurrence with the conclusion of USPS's safety and health staff that remedial efforts had successfully eliminated any significant risk of anthrax disease for its occupants uh, of this building, thus allowing workers to enter the building without respiratory protection for most of the activities. These conclusions were based upon sampling results and analysis, as well as assessment of safety and health plans formed by OSHA's certified industrial hygienists. As postal employees return to Kersine and Morse, OSHA will continue to respond to any safety and health complaints filed by its employees, as well as to requests from USPS and its contractors. The agency is also prepared to investigate accidents or any other hazardous situation that occur at the facility. We are also broadening our outreach and informational activities to help employers and workers address threats of biological and chemical hazards. We've developed and continue to refine sampling methods for detecting anthrax spores uh, in the air and on large surfaces, and, uh, such as floors and walls. We've created a web-based e-tool that provides training and information about anthrax and also increased our expertise in dealing with threats and other incidents of national significance. We will soon complete our own national emergency management plan for OSHA, national and regional office personnel as well. Now, since September the 11th of 2001, we've become aware of new threats to workers' lives from acts of terrorism and the use of biotoxins as weapons of mass destruction. OSHA is continually evaluating and making changes to its programs to respond to this new threat Postal workers have been on the front line in this war against terrorism, and it is our responsibility to provide all the help that we can in protecting their lives. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Day. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with you today about the Postal Service's planned reentry into the Kersine Morris Processing and Distribution Center here in Washington, D.C. Uh, with me today is Jerry Lane, the manager of Capital Metro Operations. I believe today's hearing is a reflection of your commitment, both as individuals and a committee, to the cooperative process that will return this facility to safe and productive use for our employees and for the Brentwood community. It's been a challenging two years, but we have achieved our goal, the successful decontamination of the Kersine Moores facility. While we are pleased that we have come this far, we cannot forget the awful events that set this process in motion. Joseph Kersine, Jr. and Thomas Morris, Jr. tragically lost their lives. Many others suffered terribly when they became infected with anthrax. As we move forward, those individuals will never be far from our minds. And that is why the planning, processes, and technology that we relied upon to decontaminate the Kersine Morris facility could only be the best, and it had to be done right. It became apparent very quickly that we would be writing the book on this subject. And it was a book on a grand scale, a scale of 17 million cubic feet, to be precise. But we had a great deal of help from experts in the military, government, and private sector. Our partners included the Armed Forces Radiobiological Research Institute, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 
District of Columbia Department of Health, the United States Environmental Protection Agency, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, as well as our three contractors, Ashland, Sabre, and Shaw. Of course, the generous help of Congress and the administration in making $762 million available to the Postal Service to respond to the anthrax attack was also a critical part of the success. The process of reclaiming the Kersine Morris facility actually began on October 21st of 2001 when it was closed. While our primary focus was the safety of our employees, we also had to address operational issues such as the disposition of the one million pieces of mail that remained at the building. We arranged for the irradiation of this mail at contractor sites in Ohio and later New Jersey before it was returned to Washington for processing and delivery. Once the mail was removed from the building, we completely sealed it and developed a thorough decontamination plan. Qualified contractors began cleaning known contaminated surfaces in the building. Pumping and mixing stations were constructed for the chlorine dioxide that would be used for the decontamination. Scrubbers were built to neutralize and remove the chlorine dioxide from the building following fumigation, and backup systems were put in place. We tested every element of our gas manufacturing, delivery, and scrubber system to ensure they operated properly. Safety was the watchword. An expert environmental clearance committee was formed in July of 2002 to provide an independent evaluation of our cleanup and testing efforts and determine if we could ultimately reoccupy the building. That decision would not be made by the Postal Service. Committee members included representatives, and I want to go through the list because they were of great help to us, although there are several to mention here, but they included the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner of the District of Columbia, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, U.S. Army Center for Health Protection and Preventive Medicine, the Occupational Safety, uh, Health and Safety Administration, the District of Columbia Department of Health, the Armed Forces Radiobiology Research Institute, and the University of Minnesota School of Public Health all participated as ECC members. On December 14th of 2002, fumigation began. We established and maintained a temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit and a relative humidity of 75% within the building. This was necessary so any anthrax spore would be receptive to the neutralizing ability of the chlorine dioxide gas. Chlorine dioxide was then pumped into the building until we reached a concentration of 750 parts per million, and we maintained that concentration level for 12 hours. Afterwards, sampling results confirmed that the fumigation process was successful. We used more than 6,000 surrogate spore strips to ensure that the chlorine dioxide permeated the facility. All of the surface samples and aggressive air samples showed no growth. By February 26th of 2003, members of the Environmental Clearance Committee were able to enter the building without personal protective equipment and agreed, as I quote, the fumigation of the Kersine Morris facility met the criterion of the U.S. Postal Service and the District of Columbia established for a successful fumigation effort. That standard was no spore growth. On May 30th of 2003, the ECC concluded the fumigation was successful and we began restoring the building. The restoration is now near completion. More than 600 tons of debris have been removed. Uh, the entire facility has been cleaned and painted, medical unit replaced, restrooms rebuilt, electrical and telecommunications wiring replaced, cafeteria kitchen re renovated, uh, mail processing equipment renovated and rebuilt, ceiling tiles replaced, employee lockers installed, safety and emergency systems repaired, modernized, or replaced, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems upgraded, retail area, uh, and the office space has been modernized. And finally, I would note delivery barcode sorter 17, the machine that processed the letters for Senator La uh, Dashiell and Leahy, the most contaminated spot in the building, no longer exists. They were dis it was dismantled, removed, and shredded. We assigned a full-time safety professional to the facility to ensure a safe and healthy working environment for our employees and con uh, contractors renovating the facility, and in conjunction with OSHA, we implemented an aggressive post-fumigation transitional sampling program with particular attention to many areas that were disturbed by construction. More than 1,000 wet wipe surface samples have been taken. 
Dry filter units located throughout the building have been sampling air around construction areas, and that sampling also includes the use of high-efficiency particulate air filters. Every sample has tested negative for anthrax. These test results are made available to employees every day. We will continue testing when operations resume at the facility using air sampling and mail processing areas. A sophisticated sampling system will provide rapid, on-site DNA analysis of air samples. If Bacillus anthracis is detected, the building will be evacuated, local health and public safety officials alerted so that they can quickly take appropriate action to protect those employees who may have been inside. I'd also note, given the events of the last uh, day or so in Greenville, South Carolina, we have a well-established nationwide process for dealing with suspicious mail. Last Wednesday, an employee at the Greenville, South Carolina airmail facility annex did what she had been trained to do. She recognized a letter that looked suspicious. She notified her supervisor. The letter was isolated and contained. Local officials were contacted, as well as the FBI. A hazmat team responded and removed the suspicious letter from the building. When we were contacted by the CDC and the FBI to let us know that they, in fact, had found ricin through their testing, we then took the further steps over the course of the last 24 hours to close the facility, bring in medical officials to speak with all those employees that had been at the facility. Uh, I would point out that this entire process is a demonstration of just how seriously we take these matters and how well the process can work uh, when employees are trained and aware of what to look for. Right now, mail delivery to federal government offices in the District of Columbia continue to have their mail irradiated. Last week, we announced a proposal to locate a mail irradiation facility here in Washington. The preferred site is on the property of the Kersine Morris Processing Center. A local facility would reduce costs, improve delivery time, and minimize logistic and security requirements. We'll work closely with the community and its elected rec representatives as we develop this proposal. I am pleased to report on September 19th, the Environmental Clearance Committee concluded, and I quote, the remediation was successful, that rigorous sampling was unable to find any residual viable spores, that workers can safely return, and that normal service to the public can safely resume. I uh, certainly welcome this finding. Mr. Chairman, as we prepare to restore operations to the Kersine Morris Processing and Distribution Center, our memory of those days guides what we do today. We will continue our efforts to explore the latest technology and process solutions to protect our employees, our customers, and the mail. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your time and interest in learning more about our efforts to reenter the Kersine Morris facility and would be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Lane. <coughs> Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. We need a, your microphone, I don't think, is on. You have a button there. There we go. I'll try it again. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Davis and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today about the efforts of the Joseph Kersine, Jr. and Thomas Morris, Jr. Processing and Distribution Center. In October of 2001, the United States Postal Service, its employees, its customers, became victims of, of a series of unprecedented and insidious acts of bioterrorism. As a result, the Kersine Morris facility has been closed since October 21, 2001. This facility is a major mail processing and distribution center for the Washington, D.C. area. Despite losing their primary mail processing center, the Capital District employees continue to provide mail service to the residents of the Washington, D.C. area at among the best service levels ever. At the time the facility was closed, I was the Capital District Manager. My office was in the Brentwood Road facility. So I understand the anxiety and uncertainty and the concern that these attacks caused my employees. These are my coworkers. Their safety and health and the public safety has been and will continue to be our paramount concern. We also work closely with the Centers for Disease Control and the District of Columbia Department of Health to assist their efforts to provide medication to all employees. During the weeks following the anthrax attacks, public health officials were uncertain about the extent of the exposure and risk. So we supplied our employees with protective masks and gloves. 
We worked very hard to reduce the impact of the facility closing on our employees. We quickly moved operations to alternative locations. Employees were struggling with new routines for getting to work. So we provided no cost transportation to provide employees to these locations for the first three months. We continue to reimburse employees who drive beyond their normal commute or who take public transportation to get to these temporary locations. We understood that communications was key. We made a point of communicating actively and cooperatively with everyone in every way involved, including the District of Columbia government, our employees, their unions, and local residents and businesses. We participated in numerous town hall and employee meetings, sent out community-wide mailings, provided toll-free telephone numbers for additional information, posted current information on the USPS website, and held weekly coordinated information sessions. As part of the reentry process, those employees who returned to work at the Kersine Morris Processing and Distribution Center, we offered a fit test for masks. The use of these masks is strictly voluntary. We understand that some employees may prefer the added sense of security they provide. We established an extensive communication plan to ensure that all employees are aware of all aspects of the cleanup and aftermath of the Kersine Processing and Distribution Center. As part of the communication plan, we have been providing our maintenance employees who have returned to the facility with daily safety talks, daily sampling result reports, and employee publications on specific information about the process. There is also an open door policy with an on-site safety professional. Any safety and health concerns that employees have voiced are immediately addressed. There has been a lot of information out there and we want our employees to know what we know and when we know it. So the communication plan also established communication facilitators at all locations on all shifts who are responsible for disseminating stand-up talks, gathering questions, and maintaining the Kersine Morris Update bulletin boards. But sometimes employees want to ask questions of the experts. So we've had a number of employee town hall meetings as well. Our communication plan also included many other ways of providing employees with timely, accurate information. We provide right to know forms at the time clocks. Employees can mail the forms in and receive prompt re replies to their questions. We establish an 800 number where calls are returned within the next business day. A special number was also established for deaf and hard of hearing employees. We've held biweekly telecons with all local unions to keep them informed of the progress on the facility. We've given local union members two private tours of the facility to show them the progress of the restoration. As Tom Day mentioned, the restoration of the building includes a new medical facility, which will have 24-hour doctor and nursing available. We have held a number of focus groups with employees to discuss their concerns and anxiety about returning. And we will continue to have employee assistance program counselors available around the clock to monitor, to monitor employee stress and anxiety. We will also be providing briefings, training, and publications on employee stress as we reoccupy the facility. We work closely with, OSHA, with Occupational Safety and Health Administration to develop a site-specific health and safety plan designed to ensure our employees' safety at the facility throughout the restoration and reconstruction. We have established a multifunctional team, included, including private sector expertise to imp implement a human resource plan. This plan will ensure that all Kersine Morris employees are provided with the information, tools, and training they need to feel safe and be productive when they return. With this in mind, we have agreed with our national unions to accommodate all requests for permanent reassignment to other facilities. Our schedule calls for the administrative staff to return to work in late November. We anticipate the retail and limited mail processing operations to follow within weeks. At the end of the day, we want this facility to be the best, the safest, and the most finest representation of the men and women who worked there for so many years. A reentry committee with employee and union representation is planning a reentry ceremony which will also serve to dedicate the building in honor of Joseph Kersine, Jr. and Thomas Morris, Jr. 
We recognize this facility's importance to the local community. Now that the Environmental Clearance Committee has concluded that the fumigation was successful and that employees can safely return, we look forward to reopening the facility and restoring it to its critical role of serving the people of Washington, D.C., and the nation. Thank you, Chairman Davis and, I'll, and the committee, and I'll, I'll be happy to respond to any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman Davis, uh, the Honorable Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. My name is Theodore Gordon. I'm the Senior Deputy Director for Environmental Health Science and Regulation for the District of Columbia Department of Health. On behalf of Mayor Anthony Williams and Mr. James Buford, Director of the Department of Health, we appreciate the opportunity to present testimony on the reopening of the U.S. Postal Service Joseph Kersine, Jr. and Thomas Morse, Jr. Mail Processing Distribution Center, formerly known as Brentwood. With me today are key staff involved with the decontamination and reoccupation of the Kersine Morris facility. As has been previously noted, in October 2001, letters containing anthrax spores sent to the Hart Senate Office Building also contaminated this postal facility. Mr. Chairman, the Department of Health has collaborated with the U.S. Postal Service since October 21, 2001 to carry out the process of decontamination of the Kersine Morris facility. Our comments will focus on providing an update of the role of the Department of Health in the decontamination of this facility. As you know, this is the largest chlorine dioxide fumigation process undertaken in the country. The process has three steps. The first step is pre-fumigation planning. The second step is chlorine dioxide fumigation of the facility. And the third step is post-fumigation cleaning and reoccupancy. Very early in the process, we in the Department of Health assembled the Brentwood Scientific Advisory Committee and charged it with assessing whether the work done at the facility was done according to applicable federal and District of Columbia laws and regulations and the best available science. This committee included specialists in the fields provided by the Department of Health, microbiology, engineering, medicine, epidemiology, toxicology, and environmental health. The committee included members of the Postal Union and community members from Ward 5 where the facility is located. The Honorable Vincent Orange Sr., Council Member for Ward 5, Council of the District of Columbia, also served as a member of this committee. The Department of Health contributed to each of Ward 5 community meetings convened by the U.S. Postal Service and participated in each postal worker technical information meeting. The Brentwood Scientific Advisory Committee provided advice to the Postal Service with a strong commitment to reduce the risk of decontamination of the facility and, and to ensure the safety of the community and public. The major technical issues of concern to the Department of Health been from the beginning is one, effectiveness of the decontamination, two, the proper chlorine dioxide dosage, three, the post-fumigation anthrax sampling protocols, and four, shutdown authority and reoccupancy clearance. In this regard, we have collaborated with the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, EPA, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Armed Forces Radiobiology Institute to review the results from the following. Sampling and analysis plan, wall cavity sampling demonstration plan, ambient air monitoring plan, line 17 fumigation remedial actual action plan, the negative pressure plan, the scrubber test, including carbon bed tests, and remedial action plan. The Department reviewed and advised the Postal Service on the air dispersion modeling plan and issued several permits for testing in the operation of boilers, air handling units, and negative pressure air systems. We were on site during all phases of the fumigation, working with the Environmental Protection Agency to monitor the air in the surrounding neighborhoods. In order to provide an independent evaluation, a cleanup and testing effort undertaken by the Postal Service and Kersine Maurice Processing Distribution Center in July 2002, the Department of Health agreed to partner with the Postal Service and experts from CDC, EPA, NIOSH, OSHA, American Armed Forces Radiobiology Institute, and establishing an Environmental Clearance Committee. The goal of the ECC has been to evaluate a method of results from remediation to ultimately provide a recommendation for reoccupancy. I might point out that the D.C. Department of Health set a clearance standard at the onset before this entire process of non-detect. There was no anthrax prior to October 2001, we will not permit anyone to occupy this building if we find any results of anthrax through our testing process. We have been successful in achieving that objective. 
The ECC consists of experts from the various technical disciplines, representing a variety of federal and local agencies and academia. A representative from the Department of Health and Environmental Protection Agency served as the co-chair persons for the ECC. The ECC's deliberations have involved a number of steps and stages, numerous meetings, technical briefings, consultations, recommendations, and subgroup reviews that have been used to evaluate technical issues. The ECC members also visited the facility for a walkthrough in February 26 and September 5, 2003. In closing, the Department of Health believes that the scientific and technology available has been used to identify and kill inactive live anthrax spores in the Kersene Morris facility. The Department remains steadfast to its commitment to ensure that the facility is safe for reoccupancy and will continue the mission of protecting public health. We recommend reoccupancy of this building and that the risk is absolutely minimum. Thank you for your opportunity to come before you and discuss this important effort. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I gather from the testimony everybody feels comfortable about the new building, but nobody can say it's 100 percent safe. Is that, is that fair? Anybody want to raise their hand and say it's 100 percent safe? Okay. Have all of you been through the building? Have all of you been through the building? You've been I've through. been in the building. Yeah. Well, if you, what, uh, Mrs. Norton and I would like to go through the building before it opens, and we'd like you all to join us, and we all feel it's safe, and I think we need to just demonstrate that, and I'd like to see the facility anyway. It's been a tremendous investment, and if you could join us in doing that, we'll try to do that sometime next week. We appreciate that. Um, before I get to the cleanup of the building, uh, I want to ask, uh, I'm not sure who, who to address this to, but my understanding is that yeah, this goes to yesterday's incident in, in uh, South Carolina. My understanding is that the envelope that was found uh, to contain uh, ricin uh, was indeed labeled ricin uh, on the exterior. Is that correct? Does anyone know? I, I can speak to what I know, Mr. Chairman. The, um, the letter um, was addressed, as I understand, to DOT. It, it pertains to a, a dissatisfaction with some recent rules uh, that right. DOT has passed in, in right. regards to I understand we have a, possibly a disgruntled worker or something. Right. And it was labeled in that way and indicated there was uh, ricin as a content, as part of the threat. Um, and it gets that, but the facility was immediately closed upon it being labeled ricin, right? No, it was not. Um, now, if someone had said, called in and said there's a bomb threat, would the facility have been closed immediately, or would we have stopped and looked at it? We what? have uh, different procedures uh, depending upon the threat. Uh, just to give you some frame of reference, we have over 20,000 suspicious substance incidents in the Postal Service over the course of the last two years, so better than 30 incidents per day on average. Um, so quite you never honestly, get the mail out if you had to stop. The, the, the protocol does not call for a shutdown. It does call for the isolation of the, specific, uh, the suspicious item and then the notification of local officials, which was done in this case. Okay. Um, how much did the cleanup uh, of the uh, Kersey Morris facility cost? Mr. Chairman, we don't have a final number uh, to date, uh, and this also involves the, uh, the testing, the cleanup, and right. the refurbishment. Um, I would put the estimate in the 120 to 130 million dollar wow. price range. Okay. Now, how much did Congress appropriate extra for that? Do you know? It was part of a total appropriations. We we received the 762 million in three pieces. Right. There was an initial 175 million uh, that the the president uh, provided to the Postal Service as an immediate response to the anthrax attack, uh, which was quite quickly spent on testing, masks, gloves, uh, right. heap of vax, all of that. So the 175 went rather quickly in the, the initial response in the fall of 2001. The additional appropriations came in two parts, an initial $500 million, followed by a supplemental for an $87 million appropriation. Um, the cleanup costs were embedded in that total of 587. We were required by Congress to develop an emergency preparedness plan and gave our cost estimates as to what the $587 million would be spent on. Uh, those cost estimates have changed dramatically uh, since the plan was first submitted in March of 2002. We updated it recently and we'll update it again. I mean, one of, our, one of the concerns in this committee is always uh, the Postal Service basically has its own enterprise fund and we'd like to keep it that way. 
Uh, obviously, for incidents like this, it shouldn't be the ratepayers. This is a, a, a terrorism threat, and it ought to come from general fund. And we're going to be interested in looking at that and seeing if we're putting this cost back on ratepayers or if this is general government. And we have these arguments all the time. But, Mr. Uh, Chairman, we concur. We, we believe this is a unique circumstance that should not be borne by the ratepayer. It's a response to a terrorist action, uh, much more of a national issue than a specific Postal Service ratepayer issue and, in fact, have an appropriations request for the 05 budget to help us to complete the uh, full deployment of the technology to provide protection to employees and customers. Thank you. Let me uh, ask a question to GAO. In your opinion, uh, well, let me ask you this. What is the most important thing the Postal Service needs to do to respond effectively to an emergency like this? Uh, well, first of all, I'll, to take the appropriate action to, to um, uh, close the facility or evacuate the facility, if that's what uh, is appropriate under the circumstances, to notify appropriate authorities and at the same time, communi again, communicate with employees, making sure that it provides clear and accurate information the, the best that it can. Do um, you think communication has improved between the employees and, and the Postal Service as a result of this? Mr. Chairman, yes, it seems to have improved based on what we've seen. I think a, a number of lessons were learned uh, back in 2001. I think this most recent example I mentioned in my summary statement uh, would indicate there's uh, the opportunity for continuous improvement and uh, being particularly uh, careful in communications with the employees who are uh, slated to return to Brentwood to, uh, to recognize the sensitivities of what happened in 2001. Let me ask our OSHA. Uh, rep, um, is there any health risk associated with long-term exposure to any residue of agents uh, used in, decon in the decontamination piece of this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you talked about the chlorine dioxide exposure. Uh, there is nothing there that, uh, that is recognized that should be uh, a concern to the employees. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gordon, has the District of Columbia been reimbursed for the costs that you incurred during the cleanup of the facility? Uh, not to my knowledge, Chairman Davis. Um, certainly it's not just the Department of Health, it's the Police Department and other agencies that participated in this process. Um, um, we're providing that information to Dr. Gandhi so that we can provide an adequate listing to the uh, Postal well, if you Service. you could get that to Mrs. Norton and, and, and to me and the committee, we would be very uh, grateful for that. Very, very good. It shouldn't be a cost. I think Ms. Norton agrees with me of the city in a case like this. Um, you think that the, has your department's response to biohazards changed since, since anthrax? Oh, happened? certainly. I mean, since the whole anthrax event. As you know, we have not only been involved in the decontamination, but we provided the antibiotic therapy for approximately 17,000 people, the majority of which were from the postal facility. Um, our response uh, in dealing with these types of circumstances have changed dramatically. And certainly uh, this has uh, been a best management practice for us. As we move forward, it's as, as, as Tom Day indicated, we've kind of written the book on this. Um, let me say this. The collaboration that existed between these federal agencies, I think, is somewhat unique in history in that we came together, we clearly defined the problem, and we focused on resolving that problem in what I would characterize as a superlative manner. I'm not saying that this was a rubber stamp, but I want to say that the scientists and the engineers came together and they focused, and we worked hard to do and apply the best science in this country, and I think that's what we've achieved. Had there ever in history been an issue like this before where anthrax had been sent through the mails? Maybe. Not to my knowledge, no. Any, anyone aware of anything? So this really was, I mean, you live and learn, basically. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let me ask the Postal Service, can the equipment that you're planning to install now detect hazards other than anthrax? Could it, would it detect the ricin? For example, uh, Mr. Chairman, it it can detect other biological hazards. The system that we've worked to develop with our suppliers is capable of multiple threat detection. It obviously has been developed initially for anthrax, but is capable, and we are working towards additional threat detection. Ricin, however, is not a biohazard. It is a biotoxin. It's actually a protein. Um, if there is residual DNA content from the castor bean from which it, can, which it is produced from, you can sample for that DNA content. However, a purified form of ricin, which is truly where the threat comes from, is not detectable by this kind of uh, 
PCR-based DNA analysis. Now, we are going to hear testimony later uh, from the American Postal Workers Union that the biohazard detection equipment you are planning to install is not going to be used on, on pre-sorted mail. Uh, I, I guess because pre-sorted mail has an identifiable sender, terrorists would generally be deterred uh, from using it. Is that the rationale in terms of costs and cost benefits? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, as part of our, our emergency preparedness plan, there is a vulnerability, a vulnerability threat and consequence management assessment we perform. Uh, that is a classified document, so we have not put it in a public domain. Uh, we went through and assessed 162 scenarios, and when you go back and look at biological threats such as anthrax, um, pre-sorted mail, mail are produced in bulk quantity, while not impossible to contaminate, is highly improbable and an impracticable, uh, impracticable uh, vector for the attack. It would be virtually impossible to do a targeted attack, and the method by which you would do it would likely contaminate the facility where the mail is produced and infect those employees. And you also have the issue that you already pointed out of a known shipper. So there, there's a number of reasons why, although possible, not a very practical way to do it. Thanks. I also understand that the employees have asked for medical and mental health professionals to be on site uh, when employees return. Uh, does the Postal Service have a position on that request? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, Chairman. Um, in fact, um, we, um, we have uh, plans to have 24-hour doctors and nurses available to them. Yeah, on site or just available? On site. Oh, okay. All right. Um, what kind of training do employees receive for responding to an emergency uh, like a bioterrorist attack? Obviously, you look at this incident, you have to refocus, uh, you know, your, your orientation and your training. Are they getting additional training now? Nationwide, yes. We, we have defined protocols. We have always had uh, hazardous uh, material response teams, uh, typically from within our maintenance craft of employees uh, that have been available to, to deal with this, particularly at our processing centers. But there has been an increased focus uh, on what to look for in suspicious mail items. And again, I would point out, with over 20,000 reported incidents over the last two years, we obviously have employees who have been trained and do pay attention. Again, the, the most recent incident that was reported in the media yesterday was the uh, direct result of an employee that was paying attention and did the right thing. Thank you. Uh, those are my questions. Ms. Norton. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman Davis. Um, we really need more information about how you would handle a contaminated uh, item that wasn't labeled. We congratulate you on dealing apparently expeditiously with Ryzen. It certainly helps restore our confidence. But of course, it said Ryzen right on the label. So it's hard to credit uh, detection by the Postal Service when obviously somebody was trying to let you know that it was something dangerous and you had to see if it was dangerous uh, at all and you found out that it was dangerous. Um, suppose the, the ricin had not been labeled. How would it have been detected? Uh, let me first point out that, again, with the number of incidents we have had, the overwhelming majority are not because it is labeled as anthrax, ricin, or anything else. Have you found ricin before in the No, we have not. Um, the, the fact is, is that our employees have been trained on some of the specific, uh, specific things to look for on what might be suspicious. Have they been trained to look for ricin? They are trained to look for suspicious things coming out of the envelope or mail piece and what the characteristics might be. Did I this come out of the envelope? Excuse me? Did the ricin come out of the envelope? No. I would tell you that if it wasn't labeled, um, other than the fact that it did not have postage on it, which obviously would have brought our attention to it and the way it potentially was addressed, there was nothing about the way it was made up or anything spilling out of it. Uh, that would have brought attention. It if, the, if it had continued as an envelope, we, at first, apparently, the Postal Service and the CDC thought that anthrax couldn't come through the envelope and, of course, the facility wasn't shut down. Can ricin come through the envelope? And if it does, what happens? Ricin is one of the... Um, Maybe I should ask Mr. Gordon as well to chime in here. Okay. 
I, I can just tell you from our threat assessment, we, ricin is possible, but it is, is viewed as one of the impractical means to be sent through the mail. But it is possible. Well, it was sent through the mail this time, Mr. Day. So I'm not talking about a hypothetical here. Congressman Norton, <clears throat> uh, it is possible, but it is very improbable that you would have the same type of dispersion and distribution that you would have with anthrax spores. Suppose some came through the envelope. Could it harm an individual? Um, I mean, can you inhale it? I'm just trying to find out what the threat is there. The, we don't the, know what the substance is. I think through the mail service or through an envelope that the risk is much more minimal. Uh, than with anthrax. Absolutely. Um, and also... The, how does it poison people? How does it, how, what, is, what, is it, what are its symptoms? What does it do to you? <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a protein process. It, uh, it can affect the central nervous system. It uh, can affect the lungs. It can cause uh, cardiopulmonary distress on someone who may have some clinical problems. So it normally is, would you breathe it or would it have to get on your body? You could breathe it and or skin absorption. There are three pathways, inhalation, skin absorption, and ingestion. Those are the three pathways for which it could But could you think you pretty illness. much it would have to get out of the envelope. Yeah, and you'd have to have what we characterize as a substantial bioload and exposure like we did with anthrax. And I don't think that you have ricin as the type of, of uh, substance that uh, has the same dispersion capability as anthrax. Um, uh, and Mr. Gordon, who has uh, anthrax? Who, who has access to ricin in this country? Ooh. I mean, is it, you know, do laboratories have it? I mean, is it a prohibitive substance so it's hard to get a hold of? Is it easy to get a hold of? Uh, Congresswoman, my understanding from what I know of ricin, it, it is produced from castor bean. The technology required to refine uh, the the extract from the castor bean is is not overly sophisticated. However. Getting it into a weaponized form uh, is is a bit more of a challenge. So it is not it is not a controlled substance. It is something with uh, a person with a level of knowledge, not overly sophisticated, could produce it from a castor bean. I, I suppose now that we've had this tragic episode involving anthrax, there are all kinds of precautions that have been taken here. But very frankly, the president uh, and Congress and federal officials now are perhaps as much concerned about substances that haven't yet come into the mails. We're concerned about bioterrorism. So I've got to ask you about other toxins and chemicals and things like, you know, we got the bejesus scared out of us about smallpox until we found out that, that, that it perhaps caused more harm than not to try to vaccinate everybody. Uh, but I'd like to ask you about other substances that uh, may come through the mail and whether the, uh, quite apart from anthrax, whether you are prepared uh, for other substances that may come in the mail just as ricin has come through the mail uh, just this week. Uh, and so what in the world, how are you prepared? I, I'd like to just give some clarity to your earlier question and, and give you some additional information. Uh, the ricin is a chemical. It is not a bacteria. Anthrax is a bacteria which is microscopic and went through the, uh, uh, the envelope itself because of its porousness. Uh, racine, uh, racine is a chemical compound that is derived through uh, various methods, uh, very rudimentary as Tom Day has indicated. You would have to have a substantial amount of this chemical for someone either to inhale or ingest in order to become a major risk factor. And so more than anthrax. Substantially more than anthrax. That there are it. no bio loads, Congressman Norton, for anthrax. In other words, one of the difficulties and challenges that we had and why we set a non-detect level for Brentwood is there is no exposure dose ratio set in the United States for anthrax. A person who may be exposed to one or ten spores could contract the, the disease versus a hundred spores. So therefore, the standard of non-detect is what is important. You know, Mr. Day, you're aware that a, a woman who, an employee who worked within feet of uh, one of the employees who died uh, found a suspicious uh, letter um, that had powder in it came to employee, it came to supervisors and uh, spoke about it. It turned out to be false positive, but 
she was turned back. I want to know if somebody came with such a letter today. Uh, I mean, she was very fortunate it wasn't that, but she knew somebody was ill. And, uh, and, and uh, there are all kinds of, uh, of uh, concerns that were raised that uh, there were some supervisors who repr reprimanded employees when the numbers went down uh, f immediately following the incident. Nothing has been found. People were reassured, told them, go back to work, get your work done. I want to know what happens when somebody comes with maybe a false positive and says, this envelope looks to me like it could contain something. Now, we know that the chances are, you know, 99.9% .9 perhaps that it won't, but I want to know what, if she has in hand something, what, what the Postal Service then says to that employee. You and Mr. Lane tell me, uh, whoever is in the best position to tell me what your regulations now tell me should happen. We in, have a defined uh, process and procedure um, on how to handle such an event. And first of all, I would point out the first part that we have told employees, and hopefully they will follow, is that they wouldn't have it in their hand. Uh, so if what they, would they do? If they have a mail piece that is suspicious or has powdery substances coming out of it, they are to identify where it is and notify a supervisor or manager. It is now, has they, this training is this training that has now been given in Brentwood and to postal employees throughout the United States. What you're just telling me? That training has been provided over the course of well over a year. The process has been defined. Employees have been. So don't trained. touch it is what they're told. Do not touch. Notify. Isolate and notify local authorities. The Postal Inspection Service becomes involved as well as local officials. Again, we've had over 20,000 incidents postal service wide in the course of the last two years. We've experienced some level of facility shutdown as we've dealt with suspicious items. Um, thank you very much. Now, I'm, uh, I'm concerned about information that is beginning to emerge uh, about the slow close down, the delayed close down. Uh, and of course, Postal Service has said, well, you know, the CDC made me do it. Uh, would you rely on the CDC today? You know, we, we went to the scientists and they, they said it wasn't, un, it wasn't necessary is what we were told over and over again. Would you rely on the CDC today or would you close down a facility uh, even without CDC or other scientific uh, uh, other scientific affirmation. Congresswoman, we, we must reply, uh, um, rely upon public health and medical experts. Um, the example of the Greenville, South Carolina situation. I, along with other senior managers in the Postal Service, were involved in telephone conversations with Homeland Security, CDC, and the FBI. We jointly made that decision. We must continue. Did they look at the substance first? Excuse me? Did, did they test the substance first? They came to us and let us know that they had uh, trace amounts of ricin. We then had a discussion about, as they indicated to us, they found the trace amounts, but the vial was sealed. We had a discussion what was prudent to do. So, you know, once we again, they said, look, you know, it's sealed. We haven't had time to, we haven't had time to test it, but... No, we jointly reached the conclusion that we needed to close the facility, uh, get public health people there talking to employees, and we're testing the facility. How soon after? The discovery was the facility closed. The the discovery we found it last week. CDC uh, came back to us with the positive results in the last 24 hours. That's when we reacted when we had a result. So you found it last week. You didn't know. Of course, it said it was resin, ricin. Last week on what day? It was last uh, Wednesday, the 15th, I believe. And it was closed down when? Uh, we, we closed it down um, yesterday, so a week. But right the same day that we were notified that we had some result that indicated there was a problem. Up to that point, it had been removed from the facility and nothing had been indicated. It was just like many other incidents so we've had. So you waited until it was tested? Is that why you waited that long? You, you have to. You have to get a result to understand what you've got. Up yeah, well, to that's that point, exactly what the CDC said. Look, I, I, you know, I'm concerned. Let me, let, 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 that concerns me. The thing said ricin. I can understand if you had an unidentified envelope. The thing said ricin. It could have been a prank. But what, what is this, almost a week that you waited to close down the facility? I mean, that, that, that's of some concern. Uh, I don't know if there's over-dependence on 
the scientific uh, experts as there was on CDC, as there was a dependence on CDC or what. But let me, you seem to have, cause, and, and I think I'm going to ask you to look uh, far more closely at what you do, particularly if you have a labeled matter. Now, I don't want to indicate that every labeled matter, uh, but apparently, even in your conversations, they told you there was residue. There appeared to be residue there. And uh, you didn't close it, or oh, that didn't happen until a week later? We found out yesterday what what they had sampled. We had nothing prior to that. Except the labeled... Uh, Just, and okay. unfortunately, Congresswoman, we get things sent through the mail that have any number of uh, anonymous hoaxes written on them. That, unfortunately, is too commonplace. Okay, Mr. Day, I'm going to assume, from what I heard from, from uh, Dr. Gordon, that uh, what's generally known about ricin would mean that knowing only that this was labeled ricin, uh, knowing what, uh, at least he informs us, uh, about the nature of ricin and its ability to contaminate far less than anthrax, that that may have been a reasonable decision not to shut down for that period of time. I'm really not trying at all to show you didn't do the right thing. I am trying to be reassured and to reassure uh, members of the public and the employees that we are today using the best we have. Now, now uh, I, I have a question about your own policies and regu uh, regulations. Um, four days um, after the anthrax letter was open on Capitol Hill, and the date I'm looking at is October the 19th, 2001. The Postal Service apparently issued a policy, a written policy. Um, as, as I am informed, it stated that the discovery of a suspicious or unopened envelope uh, should trigger the shutdown of equipment. Uh, an evacuation, cordoning off the area. That's what your own regulation said. Um, now, you were aware that the Daschle letter had passed through that facility on October the 15th. So responding by the 19th, you had new regulations. That, that's very good. That's a quick response in writing. Uh, however, the facility itself was not shut down. Uh, in fact, it was kept running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And there were 2,000 employees in that building, approximately. Um, to me, this says you weren't following your own regulations, despite the fact that a letter had been found here and everybody knew that that letter went through Brentwood. Uh, and I want to know, in light of that, in light of your own written response, why there was a delay in shutting down that facility, at, given what you knew about that letter, that Daschle letter on Capitol Hill. Yes, ma'am. The let me just clarify what we put out on October 19th, and I don't specifically rem remember that date or or that what was issued that day. But I can tell you, there were existing policies in the Postal Service. Something which I specifically remember because a year and a half prior, as a district manager in Southeast New England, we had gone through a simulation of an anthrax event. So you had used existing policies plus a new policy. The new and policy. The one was I'm interested in is the one that says shut down the place. Court but let off me be clear on what the policy was and what we knew of how this worked on October 19th. The existing policy and the clarification spoke to shutting down the facility where the letter was found. The concept of a trail of contamination was not known on the 19th. The letter in question, the Dashiell letter, was in the Hart Building, which was shut down. That's in full conformance. We didn't have the concept. History now tells us much different, and our policies have changed to reflect that. But what we didn't know on the 19th 
was that there was a trail of contamination that went back upstream. Well, but wait a minute. You, you did close. Um, you did know enough, apparently, to close the Trenton po Postal Facility. The Trenton you, Postal Facility. And you certainly knew enough to close the Capitol Hill mail facilities. One's an upstream. Capitol Hill is a, is a downstream. The, Yet the Brentwood, which is midstream, remained open on the 19th, the 20th, and part of the 21st. Why shouldn't we conclude that Brentwood was treated differently from these other facilities? And why was it treated differently if you were so quick to close down upstream and downstream? And here's Brentwood in the middle of it and not close down. Take it on either end. In Trenton on the 18th of October, you have the first incident of a postal employee, a letter carrier, who is diagnosed as suffering from cutaneous anthrax. In dealing with local public health officials in the state of New Jersey, specifically Dr. Ed Bresnitz, a decision was made given the specific known issue, in, or issue of an employee of the Postal Service with cutaneous anthrax that facility was closed. Say, how many hints do you need? Unfortunately, we did I mean, not. This, this person had anthrax. He's upstream. Uh, no, no, that's not upstream. That, that is at the source. That's, that's where it occurred. And in turn, again, working with local public health officials, we had not yet come to that conclusion. That was not the advice. I think Mr. Unger had not yet come to the conclusion that it could travel. That we had this path of contamination. Hindsight that being what? 20. I'm sorry, that, that what? You There's a path of contamination. First of all, what, was the con what, what did we learn about that employee at that, the, at, at that time, the postal carrier? Up in New Jersey? Yeah. That that specific carrier was suffering from a case of cutaneous anthrax. Okay, he had it. She had it, yes, at that facility. And so there was an advice from local public health officials to close Trenton, New Jersey. We were responsive to what public health officials advised us to do. In New Jersey, on the 18th, given that case, we closed. When the, Mr. Morris, Mr. Kersin, Mr. Richmond were diagnosed over the course of the week under the 20th and 21st, then in turn public health officials said we needed to close. We did that. We did not know right. that on the 19th. Uh, again, <laughs> once you get, I don't know what to tell you, Mr. Death, but if they, uh, Mr. Day, but if there are deaths around me, I then began to look very closely at what had been the, the existing knowledge. Uh, and I, I recognize uh, uh, that that but was the only a postal carrier. That that's a postal carrier who had a letter, right? We believe he had the letter. Now, we believe that somebody, we now know at least two people in Brentwood, had a letter. Again, I, I, I don't find it hard to connect these dots. Not on the 19th, though, Congresswoman. The, the only death as of October 19th was Mr. Stevens in Boca Raton, Florida, at AMI. Then you had a series of cutaneous anthrax cases that took place in New York City in the newsrooms of several network TV stations as well as the New York Post. So when you look at the dates on the 19th, you do not have, other than the first employee in Trenton, New Jersey, a case of anthrax. The first cases diagnosed here in the Washington area occurred over the course of the Mr. weekend Day, of the, the 20th the, and 21st. The, 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 what I am looking at is that people who handled mail clearly got anthrax. Ergo, somebody in Brentwood has handled mail. And yet, Brentwood is not closed. Moreover, the Capitol Hill facility downstream was closed. Why? They handled mail, but so did somebody in Brentwood, and perhaps more people than we know. But that's at the end of the stream, where you're, you're, you've got the mail room and Senator Daschle's administrative aid. You're at the end of the trail, and that's why that's closed. Congresswoman, I agree with you totally. Hindsight, again, we would have done this. It wasn't known at the time. If that's what CDC or anyone else that advised us was the right thing to do, we would have done it. We did it in New Jersey. When public health said close, we closed on the end. And let me just ask, and you won't do it again. I mean, you're, you're Absolutely. You're, you're, we, I think we all understand how anthrax and biohazards can come out. Our process and protocol calls now for when detection occurs, 
we will shut down the facility and, and work with local public health. Uh, just let me say why I am still dissatisfied. When, because there had been anthrax deaths occur, uh, that occurred in people who had handled mail, or anthrax, if not deaths, because people had gotten anthrax from handling mail, uh, because mail had clearly been handled in the Dashiell office and therefore in the Brentwood office, it seems to me that regardless of where the scientific folks are, give them time to figure it out. But you have enough real live evidence, quite apart from any analysis, that there may be danger in a particular facility where people have handled anthrax. And that's what I want to be assured of, that if in fact people can connect those dots, you will not do what you did with the CDC. We waited for them, our hands are clean, and, and we did what the scientists told us. I'm looking for some fail check. And I tell you the best fail check I can think of, somebody got sick in a facility that handled this. I don't want to know anything else except will somebody get sick here which is handling the very same substance. Now, I would ask that uh, the Postal Service consider what I am saying. I'm now talking about uh, not depending on the, on, on the scientific evidence. I understand that that can take time. I'm saying, depending on real evidence, that by analogy could likely apply to this facility, even though it isn't in this facility. I hope I am clear, and I'd like to know uh, uh, if, if the Postal Service is willing to con consider this, this chain of, uh, this chain of, this chain problem I'm talking about, where you got to figure it out even though you don't have the substance tested. Congresswoman, I, I would tell you, let me, let, let's speak to a, a real world example where we learned our lesson, we established new protocols, and we implemented them. Um, this past year at the Federal Reserve here in Washington, they reported to us uh, back in January that they had a preliminary positive on a piece of mail at the Fed for anthrax contamination. We, in fact, specifically reacted to it. We knew the trail of mail that that would have followed. We went to the V Street facility where we process government mail. That facility was closed. I personally was involved with the notification to the public. Jerry Lane personally notified the employees. We shut down the facility. We got it tested. We made sure we took care of it. What about Brentwood in that instance? Excuse me? What about Brentwood? Did it go through Brentwood? No, it did not. We followed the trail. It was processed at the V Street okay. Annex. All right. We, that, so that's not theory. That's a real world case. Well, I just we, gave you a real world case, and you have not satisfied me with respect to that real world case. I congratulate you on the real work. And you, as you say, you, we've learned our lesson. I do want to know whether or not uh, we are also dealing with an analytic process. Yeah, I will. With an analytic process whereby you have to do what physicians do. Physicians often diagnose without having the scientific evidence. They have to put it together. That, and, and that's essentially the kind of process I'm asking you also to use. Mr. Unger? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Norton, I just wanted to mention this. The, the, our uh, testimony today was based on our work at Brent, which, Brentwood, which is part of a larger review we are doing of the Postal Service and uh, other authorities' reaction to uh, the incidents in 2001 in several major postal uh, facilities. And as part of that review, what we would like to do is take a, a look at the revised postal guidance for dealing with these situations to see whether it would indeed cover the type of situation that, that occurred back then. So we do hope to report on that uh, within the next few months. I very much appreciate that because, you know, I'm hearing a little bit of fighting the last war here. Uh, it, 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 we've got to think uh, proactively of, of what if and we have to look specifically for a very different situation than we, we, we found. Mr. Chairman, I'm, 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 I apologize for taking this time, but I wonder if I could have uh, the, the time to pursue uh, this matter uh, yes. fur further. Of course. Um, Without I, objection. I'm now concerned about, I, I, I now want to be, I now want to ask you about other substances. Uh, 
because CDC has long existing regulations going back to 1980, as I understand it, and included uh, anthrax. There must be, for example, anthrax, if you're sending it lawfully, must be in a three-layered packaging and the rest. It's all quite correct, scientifically correct. Um, we know that researchers, we know that this, this man who was <laughs> This, this renowned scientist who was just uh, arrested, being investigated because he just carried stuff with him. <laughs> so we know that, uh, you know, that researchers may just becoming aware of what you're supposed to do and that they, they, many have obviously not been following these regulations in one form or fashion. Um, but I am concerned, uh, Dr. Gordon, um, that these regulations, these CDC regulations, said that even if taped and sealed, and the Daschle letter was quite visibly taped and sealed, there still would probably be a leak of anthrax. Yet, we were told nobody knew that, even though these regulations from the CDC said you better you know, seal all this stuff up because even if you do, there could be a, le a leak. Why didn't, I mean, they claim not to know, the Postal Service claims not to have known, and here in their own regulations, they warn that a layered envelope all buttoned up could leak. How did this occur? Well, I, I can, <clears throat> certainly I can only give you, uh, uh, what uh, theoretically, uh, anthrax, as you may or may not know, is a ubiquitous organism that is commonly around us. It's in the soil. It's out there. Uh, the, the difference between the anthrax uh, that went through the mail service processing area is that this stuff was man-prepared. It was a highly refined uh, type of anthrax that literally defied gravity in terms of its dispersion capability. So that's what they had in mind when they said it would probably leak. That's Even correct. Even if it was taped and, and sealed. And, and, and being as highly refined as it was, uh, certainly the, I don't think anyone anticipated that the porousness of the envelopes were such that it could come through the envelope. It's our understanding. Well, why did the regulations say that even if taped and sealed, it would probably leak anthrax? Well, that's, that's something, Congresswoman, you're going to have to ask CDC. It doesn't make much sense. Uh, other than that uh, the porousness of the envelope would leak it, being highly refined would leak it even that much more. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. It came through the envelope, and when it hit the uh, dusting machines with the air, it aerosolized it, and it distributed throughout Brentwood facility. Uh, 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 yeah. Your question is excellent. Uh, why it wasn't uh, uh, thought of before, I don't know. It's one of the issues that we raised at the Department of Health. Dr. Walks and I raised it. That, uh, you know, it would be common for us to understand that bacteria that highly refined would come right through that the and paper. they understood it enough to put it in their regulations, but they didn't understand it enough to tell the, the Postal Service. Uh, let me, let me uh, go further, uh, move on. Uh, I need to know uh, uh, how uh, you know, if you do, um, Mr. Day, that there is no risk to employees from the new irradiation facility that will be located, as I understand it, on the Brentwood grounds. Uh, let me, a few words about irradiation. I, I, I would preface it by saying that uh, when you, you get into a very specific scientific discussion, I'm not aware of really anybody that would describe anything as no risk. 100% right. certainty, You're zero right. risk. There's always is, risk, risk in breathing the, uh, there this is air. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking. I'm trying to be reasonable, Mr. There, uh, there is, however, because of... I mean, even the GAO leaves us with the fact they can't be... Everybody protects their butt. And if they say 100%, then they're afraid somebody will come back and say they found one-tenth of 1%. One and and so, that's the issue. So no one claims okay. no risk. All right. Low risk, however, I think is reasonable. Irradiation technology has been around for decades. It's been used for uh, food processing, medical sterilization. It's got a number of industrial uses. Uh, and so it's well known, well understood. The ability to uh, properly build a facility uh, that is uh, as low risk as anyone possibly can build one 
uh, is well understood. The facility we currently use in New Jersey, uh, it's owned and operated by IBA, Ion Beam Applications, actually a firm out of Belgium. Uh, the facility is one that I've driven by many times. I've been into it. It's immediately adjacent to Route 295 in New Jersey. Uh, there are literally thousands upon thousands of vehicles that drive by that facility within uh, 100, 150 feet. Uh, irradiation is understood. The procedures to make it safe are understood, and it's uh, well regulated. Uh, it's, it's not unlike the facility in New Jersey where we now send mail to? It would be custom designed for the uh, particular aspect of irradiating mail. And the facility employees. in New Jersey had a more industrial use. We, had, we put mail through it. This facility will be built just for mail. But most importantly, what you have with irradiation is very thick concrete or steel walls or some combination that present, uh, prevent any of that irradiation from being harmful to anyone outside the facility. And this is located in a, in a, 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 a remote corner of, of the facility? Of it's, the area. it's located in the most remote corner. Uh, for those familiar with the site, if you're, if you're looking at the front of our building where the retail is, it would be off to the left, to the left of, of the auto auction facility that's across the street from us, uh, bounded somewhat by New York Avenue and with all of the train tracks behind it. So it's on the most remote portion of our property, away the furthest away from any residence. So it's, it's quite a distance away from any residential properties. Um, will OSHA be testing this facility? Uh, <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Anyway. Yeah, this we are irradiation facility. Yes, we are prepared to continue on uh, with uh, our work with the USPS uh, to address any uh, concerns that employees have about unsafe or unhealthful working conditions, and all of those uh, uh, will be evaluated. And we're currently uh, still uh, working with the USPS and evaluating all the samples uh, that they're uh, that they're getting, and so we will continue to work with them to address. Uh, any potential unsafe or unhelpful working conditions? Uh, today, Mr. Lane, Mr. Day, I, 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 don't, know, I don't know who who can answer this question. Who would have the final say on closing down Brentwood uh, in this city? If we How's the chain of command works? Who has this? Has this? Has, who who get who? Who's who? Who call? Who makes that call? Ultimately, it remains with the agencies of the Postal Service. We certainly seek the advice uh, of other agencies such as CDC. We work with Homeland Security in the, the case of South Carolina where there's some aspect that might suggest terrorism. Uh, I can tell you as we deploy our new technology, there is a predetermined protocol that the new system we are putting in place, that if we get a confirmed result from that, that it in fact has found the DNA structure of anthrax, um, it's not really a decision. The protocol just flat out says we close down. We remove the sample. We take it to a certified CDC lab for final confirmation. So we have a facility that's closed, facility that has the machinery shut down, the employees taken out. And then if we get a confirmed result, we're working with public health to follow a medical protocol. So um, it's, it's very defined. It, it takes decision making up front. It's all decided by the protocols. You wanted to say something on that, Mr. Mr. Gordon? Yes. For, from the District of Columbia standpoint, if we felt that the postal facility or any other facility located in our community represented an immediate public health threat, we would request that the mayor declare a public health emergency and we would then move forward to request the facility's closure. And one of the great concerns here has, has been uh, information, and I know uh, uh, how much work you have done on the communication issue. Uh, but I have a question for Mr. Lane in that regard because of OSHA regulations. Because OSHA regulations don't require, and we're dealing here with a nationwide, potentially nationwide problem, and the OSHA regulations don't require the disclosure to workers of um, contamination or of the test results of contamination. Um, I don't understand how that's appropriate. As I read your regulations, they allow management 14 days to communicate potentially deadly contamination to workers. Uh, that is the existing uh, requirement under uh, 29 CFR 1910-120, which is our uh, <clears throat> hazardous 
operations uh, standard. And uh, it, that's the uh, regulation as it exists now. Uh, certainly under uh, the uh, Occupational Safety and Health Act, that if employees believe that there is some condition that <coughs> or information that uh, is, uh, should be made available to them, they can uh, contact the local office, but the responsibility for providing a safe and healthful workplace lies with the employer under the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Yeah, but they're going to look to OSHA regulations. Uh, Mr. Unger? Uh, yes, uh, Mrs. Norton, uh, uh, we identified this dilemma uh, in a review that we recently completed at the Walling uh, Wallingford, Connecticut facility. And we did make a very explicit recommendation to OSHA to take a look at that regulation because of the very issue that you just raised that an employee has to ask for the information first. Uh, in response, uh, OSHA did agree to, to relook at that uh, regulation. Uh, uh, we don't, haven't heard from OSHA yet whether they're going to change it, but they did agree to revisit that uh, regulation. Uh, Mr. Lane, are you in the process of, of revising these regulations now based on the experience uh, uh, yes, ma'am. We are evaluating uh, the uh, regulation based upon the uh, recommendation from the GAO, and we responded back in July of 2003 uh, that that's exactly uh, what well, how, we when, when, when can we expect revised regulations, uh, Mr. Lane? Uh, I, I don't have that answer for you. I'll be happy to answer you uh, at uh, provide a response later. I, I don't have the answer. Would, you, to that would you provide a response to the chairman within a week so that we know when your goal is? Yes, I didn't ask you when you have a, I, when is your goal to come forward with regulation? Okay. I, that's, I'm, I'm asking you to give the, 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 the okay. committee. Uh, there, the, there is a, uh, under the Occupational Safety and Health Act, there is a very uh, detailed process about rulemaking that has to go through a very public. Are you in the process of rulemaking now? Uh, we're, we're responding to the GAO report. We're looking to see what is the best way to uh, make uh, the Mr. Regulation. Lane, she just wants an approximation. If you can go back and, and review yeah, it, and I, I, we I, give us a ballpark. Yeah, I, I don't have an answer for you uh, right uh, now. And, and I can understand that you might not have it sitting there. It's, it's important just for us to have to it. Interest. You see, the, the way in which the government works, it's perfectly reasonable for an employer, including the federal government, to look at your regulations uh, to decide whether or not the employer is doing the right thing. The, after all, the employer is not sure. He doesn't want to panic employees. And yet he knows that his union or his other or his employees are going to say, why didn't you tell me? To avoid recrimination, uh, you may want to look at more discretion to the employer. You may want to look at a shorter time frame. But all we need to know is when you expect the process uh, to have something. And, and I'm sure the, your agency uh, sets goals for when they want to do something, recognizing that those uh, uh, goals cannot always be um, uh, kept. Yes, ma'am, we will. Thank you very much. Now, I, uh, Mr. Gordon, D.C. General is closed. Uh, it was, of course, indispensable at the time uh, because it was set up almost immediately to uh, receive people, to get CIPRO, um, and to handle people's, at least initially, their uh, health concerns. Uh, what would happen today if we had an episode? Where would people go? We would still be prepared, if necessary, to operationalize D.C. General Hospital. Uh, while the hospital hasn't been uh, operated, uh, uh, as you know, we have our health care safety net uh, uh, unit there. The rest of the facility's integrity has been maintained. Uh, it's not a situation that is crumbling down around our knees. Uh, we would operationalize D.C. General Hospital. We would also, we do have other alternative sites as part of our emergency response plan. Uh, that we could provide well, to you. What are those sites, please? I, I would prefer to provide to provide that to you under separate cover, uh, because of the, the the very nature of bioterrorism and where we would operationalize and well, set up. Well, I already know about DC General. So what well, are you keeping from us? There, all? there, there is certainly we would have access to the Armory, the the Office of Emergency Management, Department of Health is prepared to set up emergency uh, medical tech uh, operations on property. Uh, uh, adjacent to D.C. General Hospital and other locations throughout the city uh, as part of our emergency response plan. Um, um, we, uh, we, feel, we feel that we're very capable now 
to respond to these types of events. Our experience has been uh, enormous, as you know. Uh, operationalizing DC General Hospital and, and treating 17,000 people is not an easy task. I was there. Uh, but I can also tell you that uh, there's a lot of other parts, such as mental health counseling that went on from our mental health department, uh, the Postal Service's participation in working with Postal Service employees and helping them get through this tremendous effort uh, was absolutely superb. We couldn't have done it without Postal's coordination and assistance. Uh, and other offices of the federal government. Uh, and, and based on those lessons and, and how we operated, uh, certainly we feel comfortable now if we had to operationalize and treat, we could do that in, in rapid deployment. Ms. Ms. Uh, Ms. Ms. Chairman, I only have one more question. I do want to say this. At that time, D.C. General was open. Well, uh, it, it wasn't open as a full-fledged hospital that no, was open. Wasn't. So I'm, I'm taking what you, what you say, that even though the whole facility is in mothballs now, you could get right back up, because you know what? We're going to hold you accountable for that. Well, uh, we, 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 we've, we, that's one of the reasons why it's not been torn down or is crumbling around our knees. Uh, we, have, we, we have the facility. Uh, we have uh, chairs and tables and stuff that are still there. It hasn't been ravaged. Uh, we've uh, maintained appropriate maintenance on the building. Okay, and it's got electricity and There's electricity all that in stuff, the building. All that yes. good stuff. Yeah, you must understand, Congresswoman, this facility is contiguous to a number of buildings, and the power sources supply also not only D.C. General, but the D.C. jail and other facilities that are located on that campus. So we cannot individually isolate and, and, and deprogram. Uh, again, while it's been mothballed and we're not investing a lot of money other than maintaining it on a limited capital basis, if we had to operationalize uh, to deal with an emergency situation, we certainly would do it. All right, my final question is, who is monitoring the health of the employees uh, who were in Kersine Morris at the time, and what are the results of whatever studies or monitoring uh, that is being done. It is my understanding, and Tom Day can add more to this, but uh, through Dr. Michael Richardson, our chief medical officer, Dr. Richardson is involved in the monitoring of those employees along with CDC. It's my understanding that CDC has primacy, and they coordinate with Dr. Richardson, who's our chief medical officer, with relationship to follow-up complaints of those employees. As, and their coordination is also with Dr. Reed, who's the chief medical officer for Postal Service. I, I would concur with that. That is what's happening. I would tell you um, on a more personal level, personal level, having spoken uh, at a number of employee town hall meetings here in Washington as well as up in New Jersey with the employees at both facilities, um, our employees want that and they deserve it. However, there's a level of mistrust that has kicked into this. CDC has had to use a contractor to help them to do the monitoring. Uh, and to a large extent, they use telephone surveys. I've personally spoken with employees who say, why aren't they doing a better job to monitor my health? And I asked them, I said, well, were you contacted by the telephone survey? The answer is yes. Well, what did you tell them? Well, I didn't want to talk to them. We're having a problem to get employees who deserve and want this tracking and treatment if necessary, but most importantly tracking, to understand the methodology that CDC needs to employ to do it. So there is a level of mistrust, unfortunately, that's crept in there. And we're trying to get our employees to understand, yes, CDC is doing it. They are monitoring. They've done a number of reports. But as you get contacted by this uh, contractor that, that CDC is using, please communicate with them and let them know what's happening if you Has have any Has there been any improvement uh, in, in responses from employees based on I. You I don't have any quantitative data to tell you whether it's gotten better or worse. Um, anecdotally, I still hear from employees who raise the question but then admit to Is you. Is it because they, CDC, they hear the name CDC? Is that why? It's, it's the, it, I think there's an expectation that a, an MD is literally going to come to your doorstep and give you a physical exam, and that's what the monitoring is, as opposed to CDC trying to monitor a population of people and talk to them periodically through this telephone survey and understand if there's any symptoms that, that would indicate a problem. Mr. Lane. Mm -hmm. um, yes, Congresswoman. We also um, have an employee assistance program that's um, around the clock doing surveys and, and having counseling sessions with those employees to determine you know, what their requirements are, and we constantly follow up through that process as well. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
I will dismiss this panel. I thank you very much for being here. I uh, look forward to having you accompany Mrs. Norton and I when we walk through the facility before it opens. And uh, I think, Mr. Lane, you've got a couple, uh, you've got a week to try to get us some information on the proposed yes, race. Sir. But thank you very much. We'll just take a two minute recess as we switch panels. Thank you. I gave it back to Zab because you told him to reassemble it. Yeah, he has. Yeah, okay. No. Now, what were you asking me about this? I didn't understand what you said. You said something about that he gave it back to me. Okay. Are you going to? There is still concern. I know you have some here. Right. Ready to go? Well, a short recess in this House government reform hearing on the safety at the Washington, D.C. area post office affected a couple of years ago by the anthrax mailings. Second panel coming up in just a couple minutes or so. We are so. ready to move to our second panel, and I just appreciate everybody's patience in staying with us, and hopefully um, the first panel has provoked uh, some, some comments we'll get. I understand we have Dick Collins, the assistant to the president of the National Postal Mail Handlers Union, accompanied by Cynthia Vines, and Mike Reed, the Assistant Legislative Director of the American Postal Workers Union, AFL-CIO, accompanied by Corey Thompson. And uh, thank you uh, both for uh, being here with us. Uh, what I would like to do is swear all four of you in. And three, we got everybody? 
All right, I'll just, we'll just wait a second. Yeah, we're getting Collins. But we appreciate you all being with us uh, today. And uh, I know this is very, very important to your membership. You're, you're the front lines. And uh, I just say, Mrs. Norton and I both ver very much appreciate the work that you're doing um, and the hazards that you could potentially uh, encounter in any day. So uh, we look forward to your testimony. And as soon as we get Mr. Collins, we'll swear everybody in in one fell. So I'll tell you what I can do. I, I can start over here. Uh, um, Mr. Reed, I can start with you, and if I swear you all in right away, I'll start with you, and then when Mr. Collins comes in, I'll swear him in. We can move ahead. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, and thanks again for bearing with us and being with us. Uh, you can proceed. I think you can try to stay within five minutes, but this, uh, we're not real tight on it today. If you feel you need to make it, we've, we've read your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Congresswoman Norton. My name is Mike Reed, the Legislative Assistant Director of the American Postal Workers Union, which represents approximately 330,000 clerk, maintenance, and motor vehicle craft employees of the Postal Service nationwide. I am testifying today on behalf of APW President William Burris, who is out of town to attend a national APW conference. I am joined by APW Safety and Health Specialist Corey Thompson, who is available to answer any questions of a scientific and technical nature. When the anthrax crisis arose in October 2001, the terrorist attacks of September 11th were still vivid, and our nation was reeling. On October 5th, 2001, a tabloid newspaper employee in Florida became the nation's first inhalation anthrax fatality from a terrorist act. Ten days later, anthrax-contaminated mail was discovered in Senator Tom Daschle's office on Capitol Hill. Brentwood postal worker Thomas Morris died on October 21st, and the facility was immediately shut down. Joseph Kersine, another Brentwood employee, died the following day. We have certainly traveled a long road to get to the point where we are finally anticipating the reopening of the, Morris, of the Kersine Morris facility, which has been renamed to honor the two fallen postal workers. Yesterday's announcement that a piece of mail in Greenville, South Carolina contained the deadly poison ricin highlights the importance of the concerns we are discussing today. The deaths of Kersine and Morris and the closing of the Brentwood facility were only the beginning of a long and difficult period for postal workers. Some are still suffering ill effects from the exposure, and many still bear emotional scars. For two years, they have had to dramatically adjust to the disruption of their work life while struggling with the mental turmoil wrought by the attacks. I must say that by all accounts, they have endured these hardships and remain dedicated to their mission. As the anticipated reopening approaches, workers are asking the question, is the facility safe for me to return? While there was cooperation between management and labor in the immediate aftermath of the attacks, there also have been serious breaches. The Environmental Clearance Committee cleared the facility for reoccupancy on September 19th, yet this information was not provided to the union until October 20th. While we're relieved to learn that the facility is deemed safe by the experts, we are troubled by the delay in sharing this information. Five months ago, APW President Burris testified before the House Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations about the handling of the anthrax contamination at the Southern Connecticut Processing Center in Wallingford. While there was no question that the amount of anthrax present in Wallingford facility was sufficient to cause death, contamination was described to employees as being in trace amounts. A GAO report issued last April notes that the Postal Service requested and the investigation team agreed that the USPS would be the sole party responsible for communicating test results and other information to the workers at the Connecticut facility. Still, the Postal Service withheld information about the level of contamination from its workers, despite a formal request made in January 2002 by local union officials. The Wallingford situation was one of the most egregious violations of postal workers' rights in the two years since the anthrax incidents began, and it is why we are troubled by the recent breakdown in communication. It appears that the lessons learned were quickly forgotten. The Mail Security Task Force, a working group of postal and union officials formed immediately after the anthrax attacks, has been holding discussions for some time about the decontamination of the Washington, D.C. and Hamilton, New Jersey facilities and the timetable for reopening the Kersine Morris facility. The Postal Service has presented an outline, but few details, on plans for reopening the facility to workers. 
The USPS has been communicating an overview of its reopening plans to workers through workfloor talks, through letters mailed directly to their homes, and through a variety of postings at facilities where Brentwood Road employees temporarily have been working. We appreciate the increased communication in spite of the lack of specifics. The issue of whether individual employees will be required to return to work at the Kersine Mars facility was resolved through an agreement between the Postal Service and the APWU. It provides that employees of the facility will be given one opportunity to indicate whether they wish to return to that facility or prefer to be reassigned to another facility. Much has been done over the past two years, both to bring the Kersine Mars facility back online and to ensure that other facilities are safe and made safer. We would especially like to commend the USPS efforts led by Vice President of Engineering Tom Day, Tom Day to decontaminate the Brentwood Road facility and for his involvement in the development of the biological detection systems. Overshadowing much of the progress in decontaminating the facility, however, is the fact that little has been accomplished to prevent a similar incident in the future. The mail processing and collection system is complex, and the installation of biological detection systems, BDS, and HEPA filtration equipment provide only limited protection against exposure. Because more than 50% of all letter mail is processed in pre-sort mailing houses and bypasses the BDS, this equipment cannot be considered an adequate early warning system. And it must be remembered that at this time, the BDS system tests only for anthrax. Furthermore, the biological detection system may provide for a rapid response in treating workers, but only after there has been an attack. Detection would occur only after a contaminated piece of mail has entered the system, only after workers have been exposed. Sounds grim, and it is. Because postal workers are very dedicated to their jobs, they will continue to perform their duties. But they need more than a report suggesting that a workplace is safe to enter. They deserve to know that the responsible parties are dedicated to ensuring their safety and that progress is being made expeditiously. We urge the Postal Service to follow the recommendations of the Environmental Clearance Committee to continue monitoring the work environment after the facility is reopened. We urge the responsible parties to be especially sensitive to the needs of the employees of the Brentwood Road facility and to make every effort to accommodate them. Again, we'd like to thank the Chairman, Congresswoman Norton, Ranking Minority Member uh, Waxman for these hearings. We'd be happy to answer any questions you might have following the testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Collins, I need to swear you in. Could you just uh, raise your right hand? Salman, swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. You can proceed. Thanks for being with us. Thanks. Start again. Uh, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, I am Richard Collins, Assistant to the National President of the National Postal Mail Handlers Union. On behalf of 50,000 union mail handlers employed by the U.S. Postal Service, including hundreds of mail handlers who work at the Kersine and Morris Processing and Distribution Center, I appreciate the opportunity to testify about the reopening of that facility. I am, I am accompanied here today by Cynthia Vines, who serves as the branch president for the Mail Handlers Union at that facility. Sister Vines has done fantastic work on behalf of the mail handlers at that facility, and she is intimately familiar with many of the matters at issue in this hearing today. The recent incident at the Greenville, South Carolina Air Mail facility reminds us that mail handlers and all postal workers continue to fight to protect the public from potentially lethal hazards. As you noted on the radio this morning, Mr. Chairman, when the headlines disappear and the news coverage vanishes, our members remain on the job and on the front lines of defense against terrorism and biochemical hazards. We must all work together, the unions, the Postal Service, the community, and Congress, to adapt to this new world in which we live. As you said this morning, Congress must spend the money to protect postal workers and the public, and the money needs to be spent wisely. The lives of all postal employees depend on it, and this must be our paramount concern. This includes not only ensuring that the Kersine Morris facility is free of anthrax, but also making sure that the employees are emotionally ready, willing, and able to move back into the facility. To this end, the Mail Handlers Union has been an active participant in the Mail Security Task Force, established by postal management and including representatives of all unions and employee associations 
which has been meeting regularly since October 2001, to ensure that all reasonable measures are being taken to prevent any further infection from anthrax or other biological agents. We also have been active supporters of the efforts to obtain sufficient congressional funding for the cleanup efforts, both here and at Kersine, both here at Kersine Morris and at other postal facilities along the eastern seaboard. We particularly appreciate the efforts made by the members of this committee and fervently hope that the Congress will continue to provide complete funding for the costs imposed on the Postal Service because of the anthrax attacks and their aftermath. Turning to the present situation at Kersey and Morris, again, our primary concern must be the health and welfare of the postal employees who work at Kersey and Morris and who for the past two years have been scattered around in neighboring postal facilities. To meet these concerns, the employees at Kersey and Morris must know that the facility is safe. First, the employees at Kersey and Morris must know that all levels of government and postal management have done everything possible using the best available science and technology to ensure that the Kersey and Morris facility is fully decontaminated. To this point, each and every scientific study conducted about Kersey and Morris and each and every environmental sample taken at Kersey and Morris have demonstrated that the facility is ready to be reopened. Several representatives of the Mail Handlers Union, including me, have toured the facility both in June of this year and most recently on October 8, 2003, to ensure that the facility is clean and clear of anthrax. Second, the employees at Kersey and Morris must be kept fully informed about the latest developments, including information about the actual cleanup so that there is no misinformation disseminated and so that the rumor mill is not allowed to operate. It is my understanding that the employees have received routine safety talks about the reopening of the facility, that the Postal Service has been mailing copies of these talks to affected employees, and that the Postal Service currently is trying to arrange a tour of the facility for employees prior to its official reopening. While communications with employees generally have been good, there is a need to do additional training on the emergency protocols that will control after the reopening of the facility. Third, the employees at Kersey and Morris must know that they have a choice on whether to return so that employees who are experiencing particular fear or anxiety can choose not to return to Kersey and Morris without any loss of pay or economic benefits. The Mail Handlers Union and the Postal Service recently signed a memorandum of understanding that grants each mail handler who previously worked at Kersey and Morris but who does not want to return to that facility an opportunity to transfer it to a nearby location. That transfer will be accomplished pursuant to the long-standing rules that govern voluntary transfers as negotiated in Article 12 of our collective bargaining agreement. Fourth, the employees at Kersey and Morris must know that when they return to Kersey and Morris, they will be carefully monitored for any illness or other adverse side effects, whether physical or emotional, especially during the first few days and weeks after the facility is reopened. Uh, the Postal Service's testimony on that point was that the medical unit would be staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But what was not said at the microphone was what that was, that was going to be for a 30-day period, and we believe that that 30-day period should be extended. Fifth, the employees at Kersey and Morris must know that the reopening of Kersey and Morris is not the end of our concerns, but rather another starting point from which the Postal Service will take all steps that are necessary and use whatever technologies are available to ensure that postal employees and the mail that they process remain safe. Sixth, the employees at Kersey and Morris must know that their elected representatives, meaning their union representatives at the local level, will continue to be active participants in the process that leads up to and follows the reopening of the Kersey and Morris facility. If these general guidelines are followed, we believe that the reopening of Kersey and Morris can be accomplished smoothly and successfully. All of the participants must work together to ensure the safety and well-being of the employees at Kersey and Morris. Anything less would increase the fear and anxiety of these employees who have already suffered too much. And there are just a few concerns that I would mention to you, Mr. Chim. Um, we've heard about the offer by the Postal Service to do fit tests and provide masks to people in an attempt to provide some level of uh, reassurance and ease their anxiety, but uh, we believe that if the facility is clean, 
Uh, this may generate more fear than it, than it calms. In meetings with management, uh, representatives of this union suggested that very fact uh, to, the, to the Postal Service officials and that uh, apparently they had some prior commitment to promise that uh, these masks would be provided. Uh, there's also concern about the biodetection systems that are to be placed in the Kirstein Morris facility. As of now, it is my understanding that there are operational questions left unanswered by the Postal Service as to whether or not originating mail will be processed in the Kirstein Morris facility. Originating mail is the collections mail or the anonymous mail for which the biodetection systems were primarily designed. Uh, these machines are placed on individual automatic facing and sorting machines that are operated by mail handlers in such a way as to isolate individual pieces of mail as they go through the last pinch point to take air samples that can then be tested for the presence of DNA uh, that might match an anthrax profile. If that originating mail does not return to that facility, there is no set plan in place to address the concerns of the employees as to how they will be protected from any other possible contamination from anthrax-laced mail or mail that contains any other biological agents. We've been told that there is consideration being given to placing freestanding units around the facility and taking random air samplings, but we have yet to hear the final um, completed plan, and, and there's great concern as to whether or not that plan will be adequate. And finally, uh, the training that was mentioned earlier, um, it's been the experience of the Mail Handlers Union in the Kersey and Morris facility that most of that training has been handled through safety talks and stand-up talks on the floor where employees are gathered about in a group and told what to look for in terms of characteristics of mail pieces and the types of things that might indicate a potential problem. Uh, we would like to see the Postal Service move away from the paper training and do some actual sit reps and let people come into an area where a, perhaps a piece of mail that simulates a suspicious package or mail piece is placed and take them right through the drill. And we'd like that training to be done in the presence of the supervisors from that facility so that everybody in that facility gets the same message at the same time. So that if an incident occurs, we will not have to deal with a supervisor who's not familiar with the protocol or who perhaps misunderstood a protocol. We'd like everybody to get the same message at the same time, and we think that that's critical. And with that, I thank you for your time and your opportunity to testify here today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I mean, it's real clear that communications is just critical in these areas uh, from the very beginning to the end, and hopefully we live and learn, but it hasn't been as good as it could have been even in the aftermath. Is that fair to say to yeah. both of you? And you're obviously a very critical, critical part of this equation. Um, as you look at the existing protocols, and you heard the panel, the previous panel, talk about the existing protocols, and Mrs. Norton go into excruciating detail about differences and changes in, in these protocols. Are you satisfied with the existing protocols that exist, or do you have additional suggestions uh, for the uh, Postal Service uh, in terms of ha handling hazardous uh, packages or, and letters? I believe the Postal Service has some of the best written protocols in the federal government. They need to learn to follow them. Okay. Thompson. I would, um, I would agree. There are some protocols which are constantly need modification um, because things do change and more information becomes available. The implementation of those protocols out into the various number of facilities needs considerable improvement. And training is a key part of that as well, right? Training not only uh, um, about the protocols of, for the folks who are actually working, um, but the, the supervisors and managers definitely needs to be included. How about the, when it's identified or identified as a potential threat, sh how should that be communicated? Are you comfortable with the way it's done now, like in South Carolina, or, or you, you don't want to be alarmist about things if, if you have an indication? On the other hand, uh, uh, you want to make sure the people who might be endangered know that. Are, are we comfortable with that? I, I think that at this point in time, we're still um, trying to gather evidence and or information, if you will, on what occurred in South Carolina. 
Um, we know that there was a suspicious envelope discovered on the 15th, and it was the 22nd when the actual test results came back. And I, I, there, that's quite a lag of time. Um, had there been a contamination at that facility um, with the material that we're dealing with, I think we would be talking about something totally different than mm -hmm. a suspicious package and, um, and being identified at a later date. So I, I think that protocols and understanding those protocols, um, we're still looking into that particular incident. Mm -hmm. I know with uh, thousands of suspicious packages and envelopes that are found on a regular basis that yeah. um, and th therein lies the problem if you can't react to everything or any you know also more people do it and you close it down and the I, I think you can react to everything what you do though um, in those situations in handling them um, may take various considerations let me ask you each in your respective unions uh, what percent of the employees are going to return uh, to, to the, the Brentwood area facility under your agreement, and how many are opting to go elsewhere? Do you have an idea? Do you, do you have an idea, Mr. Collins or, or Ms. Vines? I can't give you a definite number. Um, you may not know till the date. Exactly. All right. We'd appreciate getting that. I'd, I'd be interested to know what that is at the uh, appropriate date. I think the committee. Uh, you think they have made adequate accommodation, though, for members who are fearful of returning for one reason or another? Is that fair to say, then, with the say agreements so. that you've gotten? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, have you been talking to your local representatives in South Carolina at this point? Mr. Reed, you want to tell us any communication you've had from them and how, the, how they're feeling at this point? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our union has five regional coordinators that uh, operate throughout the country, and our southern regional coordinator, uh, who is responsible for Greenville, South Carolina, has been in constant contact with that local, and I have been in contact with the local, as has Mr. Thompson, through the southern regional coordinator. So, yes, we've been in touch with them. And uh, they're still, as I understand your testimony, they're still feeling their way through how this was handled, what are the consequences, and it's really too early to make a determination or judgment. Is that fair? Is that, is that yes, a fair Mr. interpretation? Especially. Sir. That's a fair statement. Um, do you have any thoughts on the Postal Service's proposal to locate an uh, irradiation facility at the uh, Kersine Morris Processing Center? Either one of you. Um, we have some concerns. Okay. Um, I believe that if they must have an irradiation site, that it should not be on site with the employees. Okay. And most employees um, feel the same way. Okay. I think we're still investigating. They're in the permit phase now, and we've asked for copies of the initial um, investigation from the Postal Service, and it's, it, it, again, is early to make a determination. We haven't really gotten feedback from a tremendous number of employees that are out there at that site at this point in time. You know, it looks like, hearing the testimony from the previous uh, panel, that everybody thinks they have done everything they can to make sure this facility will be safe, but you saw nobody's willing to step forward and say it's 100 percent safe, sure. which gives us some concern. That's why Mrs. Norton and I want to walk it with them and just, uh, you know, uh, try to give some level uh, of, of comfort to uh, workers who may be coming in. Uh, what's your level of comfort at this point? What are your uh, workers' levels of comfort? Well, Cynthia and I have both been through it, so we're hoping it's at least 99.9 percent .9 clean. <laughs> And you're still here to tell about it, huh? That's right. <laughs> I, I went through there in June. Okay. At that time, there had been contractors working in the building um, for a couple of months without personal protective equipment. And, to my, and at that time in June, we were told that nobody had suffered any ill effects from yeah. that exposure. I guess the question is we're dealing with something that we haven't had to deal with before, so nobody's willing to swear up and down that it's foolproof. Is Unfortunately, the people that knew about it even back in October 2001 wouldn't talk to us about it under the guise of national security. Those were the people from Fort Detrick. Is that right? Well, Fort Detrick, I'm sure you know, is the, yeah. the weapons facility where the yeah, Army. I'm surprised they wouldn't yeah. talk to you about it more frankly. Uh, we actually, Corey and I actually helped to develop some of the early protocols and there was a, a doctor there from Fort Detrick, and many times we asked questions, and we were simply told that we could not be given that answer because of national security. And there's still no closure on the underlying case, as I understand it, either, so, uh, which also makes everybody feel a little nervous that whoever sent that letter could do it again. 
They're still out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Mr. Reed, anything to add to that? No, I, I was just thinking, Mr. Chairman, you know, if we were to guarantee that there was 100 percent safety in returning in the Cursing Mars facility, we would go in there and a lighting fixture would fall from the ceiling and hit somebody, you know. So there's just, a, it's just no way to guarantee uh, safety in that facility. But interestingly, uh, with the radiation facility that's being planned and discussed for the Brentwood, uh, Brentwood Road, we actually have a different uh, position. The Postal Service has announced that they intend to uh, staff that facility with contract employees. And we would actually be concerned that if it's going to be mail processed in that facility, we'd like it to be postal workers. Employees. Absolutely. Yeah. I okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, that kind of candor. It's refreshing <laughs> to hear it. Ms. Norton, any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been very, I think, illuminating for Mrs. Norton and myself and for the committee as we work our way through. I hope we have a successful opening and uh, the employees that are fearful that we can accommodate them in line with the agreements that you have reached with the Postal Service. And thank you uh, again for the job that you and, and your members are doing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few questions. Uh, I was interested in your, your response, Mr. Reed. I was concerned that the um, irradiation facility had been contracted out. Um, it's not that postal employees were, were doing irradiation before, but I'm aware that in New Jersey, postal employees take the mail to the facility, and of course, postal employees take the mail out. And well, I, I commend you on, on instead of running from the facility, especially in a government that is contracting out everybody except their grandmother, uh, wanting the facility to be serviced by uh, postal employees. I mean, after all, these employees are going to have to handle this mail, perhaps almost immediately after. We in the Congress don't get our mail for weeks now. And the whole point of moving it to Brentwood is, of course, to shorten that time. I was, I'd be very concerned about my own uh, residence. Uh, but I must say that when I hear that the facility here is going to be considerably more safe than the one in New Jersey because it's being constructed uh, to, to, it's being tailored. Um, I, I, if I was in the union, I would try to get those jobs is what I'm saying, yeah. rather than say, uh, unless I could, I mean, after all, your people are going to be in Brentwood. Um, and some, some balance here has to be kept uh, in the age of, um, weapons of mass destruction. I mean, I'm, I'm confronting that all, all the time in the Congress. So people want to shut down everything. Yeah, we can make everybody awfully safe. Nobody will have any jobs. <laughs> T tourists won't come to Washington or go anyplace else, and we'll all be locked down. So that's why the chairman and I, though we've been tough on the Postal Service, don't want to leave the impression uh, that uh, for the first time in the history of mankind, uh, everybody's entitled to 100 percent insurance and nothing will ever happen to them. Um, I do have just a, 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 f a few questions. Uh, I don't know if it was you, Mr. Reed, or you, Mr. Collins, who testified about this delay in sharing the information that the building had been cleared. And I don't know, I recall it to be maybe a month before you knew that. Did you ask for an explanation for the time lag? And what was the explanation given? I would have asked them had I thought about that when they were here. We just received the information, the letter, the other day um, prior to, um, well, it was prior to at our meeting for the workforce. We haven't had time to ask why the delay. Uh, the, the, our concern would be all of the discussion about communication. You get this kind of, it, what the, the words, the operative words to me are cleared. So, you know, if they were holding the information because they weren't sure, that's one thing. But according to your testimony, it was cleared. And then there was a month lag in telling people. Yes. Well, that's good news there was a month lag, but suppose <laughs> there's been bad news. Would it take, uh, would there be a gap in time as well? The communication issue has been vital here. And so uh, we, we need to know. We will have, Mr. Chairman, it seems to me we ought to ask the Postal Service why did it take a month if they cleared the facility. That's good news when I get that news out so that we don't have these lingering doubts among, among employees that something was being held back even after the facility had been cleared. Even to add to that, Congresswoman, what we think had these hearings not been scheduled for today, we still might not have it. Well, you say you don't have it, though. You don't have well, an explanation. We do have it now, but we got it 
three days before today's hearing. There is a, oh, a feeling that had the hearings not been scheduled for the day, we still might not have received the, the report. We'll find out. Um, you, you perhaps heard testimony. I, w I had been very concerned about monitoring health and had pressed the CDC. And now we heard testimony um, just before uh, you came forward that in calling employees, they don't want to talk. They think maybe, you know, maybe they're bringing trouble onto themselves. Doctors coming in, I don't know. They may fear for their jobs. Uh, I don't know what the reason is, and I want to ask you, uh, in as much as I'm sure you want their health monitored, whether it's a way of monitoring, uh, whether you think monitoring is necessary, or why you think employees are reluctant to talk on the phone to people who are trying to do uh, the kind of surveys that you initially do to know if you have a health problem among uh, subjects. With the, within the, I believe you're speaking about the CDC monitoring the health of um, employees. What I've heard from employees is, first of all, they didn't know what the call was. Um, they had been inundated with a number of um, of requests for information. They felt uh, many of our members had spoken of feeling like guinea pigs um, as part of studies. And they truly did not get a good um, understanding of what this contractor was asking them for. So in many cases, folks just said, look, I'm not talking to anybody about this. Um, it's who are you? And, and then it was, um, I'm not going to talk to you. It wasn't a, there wasn't a good introduction of this is the CDC we're monitoring. Here's did the contractor. Did the contractor uh, uh, consult with the union? No. See, they are not. You contract this stuff out, and they just do it. Neither uh, did CDC. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is something I, a, a question I'd like to have submitted to the, the CDC. We work. We will work with the committee on this question. Uh, it seems to me that if you're going to go to employees after that terrible tragedy to ask them about their health, facility isn't open, one of the first things you would say, we have, consult we have consulted with your representative uh, in preparing these questions. The purpose of these questions is uh, to assure that your health continues to be good, or if it is not good, that we learn of it in time to be helpful to you. I mean, it does seem to be rather. Than, it sounds like people going through a checklist, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I'm not sure I'd answer that. You know, if you call me with, with before you can get the words out of your mouth, I hang up the phone before I even know what you want. You know, or because of you know, these people who bother you with with phone calls. Um, uh, so I, I believe that that is a very serious communication problem. It is I who press the CDC to say we want to know employees have doubts. They don't know if, for example, if there will be remaining problems that, that, don't, come, that don't come until later. Uh, we know that the, the problem with causal effect, you know, you know what causes what. But you, we at least have to make sure this experience informs us so that we learn from it. It's a tragedy if we don't learn anything from it and if we don't learn how to help these employees stay healthy, I'm not sure uh, what, what in the world we're gonna do with it except regret it. Uh, you testified, uh, I think it's Mr. Collins, about simulated training and for the first time I think you implied that there was paper training going on and I assumed once we heard the word training that somebody was sitting down with some folks and showing them how to do things and seeing responses from them and saying, what are your questions? Are you telling me that that kind of training is not going on? The hazmat training that was referred to by the Postal Service is, is an actual training. That's something that the people that go in and, and actually take that mail out or assess it or work with the first responders get trained on. But people on the floor um, get safety talks. Now, I'm sorry, there's a distinction here between mail handlers on the one hand then and, and the postal workers on the inside. There are differences in the jobs that are performed, right. but so we it, all... But you have, you, 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 of course, you're the first line of, uh, you, 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 the mail handlers are the first ones to get hold of the mail. So they, you know, they be considered even we, a greater that's risk. That's correct. We take it off the trucks and move it inside and we do the first call right. inside the building and prepare it for the distribution functions. Now your training would be different in any case, I understand that. Uh, 
be, because you are doing a different job. Well, but you say that with the hazmat training, that is is simulated training where you actually do something and see somebody do something. Well, let me what see, is the paper Let me see training? if I can clarify what, exactly what I didn't mean for you. Um, the hazmat training, there are individuals in the facility, they're members of the American Postal Workers Union, they come out of, generally come out of the maintenance craft that get hands-on training on how to respond to a hot piece of mail or a suspected hot piece of mail. When I speak to the problems that are experienced by the mail handlers who work the letter belts and, and call that mail to prepare it for preparation, and quite possibly, I believe, uh, mail that's worked on belts by members of the American Postal Workers Union, when that mail is out in the open, in the distribution process or in preparation for the distribution process, that's when you find a suspicious mail piece. And the people who are working those belts don't get actual training on identifying a mail piece. They get shown a poster or they're given a stand-up talk or what the Postal Service calls a safety talk and they will be told what types of characteristics to look for on that mail piece, perhaps a stain from a leaking container inside that envelope, or perhaps a parcel with an inordinately large number of stamps on it, or a parcel that's addressed by hand with no return address. Those are all the types of characteristics that people are told to look for. And then they are told to leave that mail piece alone and go and get their supervisor. But all too often when that happens, a supervisor will walk over, simply take that piece of mail, walk it off the floor, or tell the employee, don't worry about it, toss it over there in the bin, let's keep moving. We've had those types of situations in the wake of the anthrax attacks at Kirstein Morris. We've had those types of problems across the country. We have brought them to the Postal Service's attention. They have gone out and attempted to remediate their training with their supervisors to avoid similar occurrences. But that's what I meant when I said they have some of the best written but protocols. Not, but they have not instituted simulated training as a no. result of those. No, and that's what I was talking about. If you take the, the supervisors, you take the employees, you put a piece of mock-up piece of mail on that letter belt, Everybody gets the training. You bring in the safety specialists, you bring in all the supervisors, you bring in the employees. Everybody gets that training. So if it does happen in real life, nobody says, why don't you go to the bathroom, I'll take this over, you know. And those are the types of things that we're up against. Um, Mr. Reed, uh, uh, again, with people who are handling mail on the inside, the same, it, it, the same, the same obtains, I take it. Um, paper, people are instructed, written, given written instructions. There, it, it is the same. We get a stand-up talk, which may may be included with any other item non-safety related. Um, there is no training program. I get the opportunity when we see them to review the training programs from the post office, and and there isn't one that I've seen that specifically says that it's titled or provides training for biohazards or detection or how to t take care of yourself. It's not acceptable. It's just not acceptable. Uh, we're going to have to uh, follow up with the the, the postal service. Um, um, first of all, they, they leave them they're leaving themselves open to liability in my considered legal judgment. I mean, once you've had this kind of uh, of thing to happen, and you then issue some paper to thousands upon thousands upon thousands. First of all, you <laughs> had it read it. <laughs> you know, you issue a piece of paper. Uh, I'm not suggesting there ought to be a test on, you know, on this paper, but I am suggesting that you have an obligation to make sure training. I do not regard reading regulations as training, not after an incident like this has occurred. I might under some circumstances, but not after. And that is a follow-up matter that we, we should have in my judgment for the, um, uh, for the Postal Service. I just have a couple of more questions. Uh, that's a very important issue, it seems to me, especially with people about to go back. I don't think it would take a great deal, uh, given their explanation of how it, uh, how it occurs, but it does seem to me you'd want to see people do it, if for no other reason to impress upon them how you're supposed to handle such mail. And particularly since we're not just talking about anthrax now, we don't know what in the world we're talking about. Um, uh, these masks, we keep hearing about these masks, and I assume that 
people don't, a lot of folks don't even want to wear any mask, you know, all day with a mask on. So I don't know how to handle this, this, this matter that we hear from time to time about masks don't fit. And you know, what, and there was, I guess Mr. Collins, you testified, was it, that, that uh, people have a concern about them? I it, mean, it's caused anxiety. They're yeah. being told on the one hand that the facility is clean and clear, and we believe that to be the truth. And then they're saying, if you're not comfortable with that, we'll provide these N95 filtering face pieces so that you don't feel too insecure or too anxious about do, performing your duties. So do people wear these masks? What do you all think should happen with these masks? Should it be well fitted and then people wear them if they want to? Do people wear them at all? Is it really necessary to wear a mask constantly at work? Um, it does seem to me that it must be something about a rock and a hard place on this one. These masks were uh, provided after a great deal of discussion on the, uh, uh, at the Mail Security Task Force and distributed around the country in the fall of 2001. Um, there were two types of masks. One was an N95 and one was an N100, and they were named a, as such because the N95 is supposed to filter out 95 percent of the particulates in a range of uh, three to five microns in diameter, and the N100 was something like 99 percent effective in that same range. And that was protection that was provided when we didn't know if there was widespread contamination in the nation's mail. Um, and, and in the wake of the uh, anthrax contamination at, at Brentwood in 2001, uh, these masks went out and people wore them for a short period of time and then very much dropped back into the, the comfort mm -hmm. zone that we're all guilty mm -hmm. of as, as human beings and stopped wearing them. Uh, yes, Mr. Thompson. I think that it, it's true. They were developed then, and they, it was done on a voluntary basis. It was also um, gloves were provided at the same period of time for folks to wear. With the uncertainty of what could come through, um, such as the incident in South Carolina, the opportunity for m our members, and our members, there are a number of them that do wear masks. There are a number of them that do wear gloves, and they wear them for their own personal protection until such time as other protections through administrative controls or engineering controls can be provided to workers that handle mail. They have to have some type of a protection, and those are provided in gloves and masks, which are considered personal protective equipment. Um, they aren't the first choice, but they are a choice. and. The issue of whether or not to provide fit testing for the mask, if you wear a mask, it should fit the best possible way. And in conversations with the Postal Service, the program at the Kersine Morris facility is for those who choose to do that. All, all postal employees can wear gloves and masks. That, that has been established since very early on in the process of, with anthrax. The, the issue of fit test is for those that want to. I, I can see the problem there. You, 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 and, and I'm not sure there's much more that you can do about it. I, do, I have two more questions. One has to do with the, bi the, the biological detection system. That is described in um, um, Mr. Reed's testimony. Um, and that is said to provide only uh, to test only for anthrax. Um, and, and of course, 50 percent of your mail, according to this testimony, uh, is processed in pre-sort mail houses in any case. First of all, is the biological detection system in place in um, Kersine Morris? No. No, it's not. Will it be in place by the time employees go back into the facility? No. No. Um, it's my understanding, again, that there are operational considerations facing the Postal Service to determine whether or not they're going to run the uncanceled meal. The, the, the biological detection systems that were produced were originally produced with the intention of protecting that particular portion of the mail stream. If they do not put, put a, a canceling operation, in the Kersine Morris facility, 
We just learned earlier this week for the first time of plans to try to protect that facility with a series of these machines placed about the facility in a freestanding manner. But we have grave... The biological uh, detection machine? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. And we have grave concerns about their efficiency because they weren't engineered to perform uh, random testing or random air sampling in the facility. They were specifically designed to be placed on those canceling machines. It's the automatic face of canceling system. These machines are placed at the very last set of rollers, the very last pinch point where the mail stream is isolated down to a single letter before it enters that machine so that the stamp can be canceled. And they, it was done that way for the purpose of ensuring that every single letter that gets processed has a chance to be sampled in the event that there is anthrax in that envelope, that when those rollers come together and pinch that envelope and create that little puff of air that we probably all saw on the news a couple of years ago, that this sampling device, this biological detection system, has the opportunity to take a sampling of that air so that the air can be sampled and tested and run against a, a, what is essentially a library of DNAs to determine if anthrax was present in any of the envelopes that were tested during the sampling period. The sampling period is intended to be roughly one hour. Every, we were told that every hour a vial will be processed to check for the presence of anthrax DNA in the mail that had been processed in that time period. Mr. Thompson. Uh, it, it is, you know, Dick had just said that we just found out that there would be the possibility that um, the machinery that the biological detection equipment was designed to operate on may not even end up at the Kersey Morris facility. And that there was a proposal to have a freestanding piece of equipment which had the same scientific principle. The concern raised. But you well, don't know whether that's going to be in there or not. The freestanding, the freestanding uh, uh, machine is that? Uh, are they going to be in there for sure? No, we we don't know that for sure. It was still left as a. They haven't. You know, the postal service hasn't determined that yet. And they may not be useful. Uh, well, in, 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 in because they're not attached to the machines. Well, that, that's very well true. They may not. Um, the difficulty comes in is there's been a two-year process in developing this equipment um, with folks from NIOSH and folks from other um, agencies doing testing to determine the best way for this equipment to work on a piece of equipment. Now, to just try to apply the analytical theory to a freestanding machine leaves a tremendous amount of sample collection, sample um, design, whether or not it can sample a sufficient amount of air, how often, and so on. It leaves a lot of scientific um, principle unanswered. And until it's tested, um, I think that we're trying to apply it to something which doesn't have good enough theory behind well, it. It looks like jerry-built uh, mechanism. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, again, I appreciate your indulgence. I just want to say to these witnesses, your testimony has been very important. Uh, we, we got good testimony, it seems to me, from the Postal Service and the scientific authorities, but uh, there is new and important information that came out because of your very uh, vital testimony, and I thank you for coming forward. I also uh, want to thank you. This has been very revealing uh, to us as, as we move ahead uh, with jurisdiction over these issues. and. Uh, Again, congratulations to the men and women that work for you. I think they're doing a great job, and we want to give them every protection and make sure the protocols are in place, training is in place, the equipment where it's needed, and that as we move to uh, reopen uh, the facility in the Brentwood area, uh, that uh, you know we meet your concerns. So thank you very much. Um, this committee stands adjourned. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, exactly. Corey? I'll go down here. Sure. Okay.
Tonight on C-SPAN, a 2004 presidential election voter focus group hosted by the University of Pennsylvania. Democratic pollster Peter Hart talks with about 20 voters and political reporters. Here's what they had to say about President Bush and the Democratic candidates 